Right, so it's not exactly breaking news that many of our political leaders have completely shamed themselves over this situation in Gaza by choosing to side with the Israeli occupiers and oppressors in their disproportionate response to the October 7th attack by Hamas. An attack which daily appears to point to more and more of the casualties of that night being perpetrated not by Hamas, but by Israeli forces themselves. But it's not just the politicians, as some trade unions have also been pretty hopeless in their responses too. And for a long while, one of the biggest has been seen as one of the worst for this, the Sharon Graham-led Unite Union, and the attitude towards anti-Semitism meted out, how the union chooses to handle that was a story before this latest escalation in the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict. But since then, her leadership of the union has led to further alleged anti-Palestine sentiment and woeful responses demanding Graham show some spine on this matter. Right, so unite the union under Sharon Graham and the matter of anti-Semitism and of the genocide we're currently watching still unfold in Gaza by Israeli forces. Trade unions aren't just about workers' rights, you see. Yes, they are about that, but it isn't just about that. As much as the mainstream media might like you to think, it's all about disrupting your life with strike action and trying to get people's backs up, getting better deals for workers as they are doing so. That's when they do that. It is, of course, a uh, a matter of last resort when it comes to that. But when they're politically affiliated trade unions, like Unite is, as one of the parties backing the Labour Party financially, they're supposed to stand up for, yes, the interests of ordinary working class people, but also the working class in and of itself, and also associate itself with sister organisations and trade unions internationally, and show solidarity where it is needed. They have leverage, even on the international stage, and given that Unite is the second largest trade union in the UK, it's certainly got a lot of weight to lend to that. What a pity, therefore, it is currently led still by somebody who seems clear and intent on choosing not to do that. Sharon Graham is seen as close to Keir Starmer, so there's a red flag for starters. This was pretty much nailed on when she invited him to speak at Unite conference last year and allegedly made the demand that anybody who wasn't very happy about that wasn't to protest at his speech, but to sit down, shut up and listen. She talks of holding him to account and talks of Labour not taking Unite money for granted. Yet Unite member dues are still flowing into Starmer's Labour's coffers as much as they ever have. It being totally unclear what we members are paying for. I'm a Unite member. I'd like to quite know that. Since all Starmer does is scrap anything he's already promised or pledged, does he not? So what exactly are we paying these dues for? Why is it that you haven't actually stopped the money then, Sharon? Anyway, that's a another video for another day. It's the Unite response to anti-Semitism and the situation in Gaza that she's caused some particular ire amongst members for more recently. Unite already have a history of having banned showings of the Jeremy Corbyn film The Big Lie in Unite buildings on the grounds they claim it is anti-Semitic, despite there being nothing of the kind featured in the film at all. It's an excellent piece of work. She banned a book signing by the excellent Middle East investigative journalist Asa Wynn Stanley in his book Weaponizing Anti-Semitism, which was intended to go along with one of those showings in Bristol. She has invited much criticism for actions along these lines that have been allegedly linked directly to her. Shortly after the Hamas attack on October 7th, the Labour Party held its annual conference, and Palestine solidarity is always a feature of that. However, the Palestine solidarity event had come in for restrictions from the party due to, certainly at that time, everything being blamed on Hamas for what was going on on October 7th. Obviously, that picture is a lot clearer and a lot more nuanced than that now. Those backing Israel at the time, though, were crowing loudly. Never mind that Gaza is an illegally occupied territory, and this was resistance to that, whether you agree with the methods used by Hamas or not. And for the record, I do not. I don't back violence in any way, shape or form. It's not constructive. But anyway, this event was organised by UNITE. This Palestine Solidarity event, organised by UNITE, is an annual fixture. But this time round, Sharon Graham apparently wanted it banned. She tried getting a union rep to do this for her, do her dirty work for her. And they apparently told her to get stuffed, do her own dirty work, or worse to that effect. She didn't show up to do so, and so the event went ahead. Palestinian ambassador Hussam Zomlot was a guest speaker, no less, so it's quite a big and important event. As we moved on to late October, the silence on the genocide unfolding from Unite's leadership was getting a little bit much for some Unite members. The Unite leadership apparently convened an emergency meeting to deal with their silence on the matter, and the result was that Sharon Graham stayed silent. By October 25th, she still hadn't made a single comment on social media anywhere on Gaza. Members wrote to Graham directly, getting rude responses in some cases. Branches passed motions demanding better of the leadership. 
And you have to bear in mind here that it is actually the union's policy, it is unite union policy to support Palestine against Israeli occupation. So all of this is in dispute with its own constitutional position. The Graham faction has even gone so far as to smear elected members of the executive by putting out a statement saying Sharon Graham was all for backing in an unconditional ceasefire, but was blocked by pesky factional members of the executive and she had her hands tied. There's nothing she could do. Well, her conduct up until that point made this utterly unbelievable. And besides, the details of that briefing then came out, which revealed the International Department of Unite were not being involved at all and that they were actually considering a TUC motion on the Gaza situation and eventually voted it down because they felt it didn't go far enough. That was despite including an unconditional ceasefire as part of it. So the Unite management's conduct thus far in regard to Gaza has not been a good one. And following an alleged diktat to executive members that they were not to march under Unite banners in demonstrations against Israel's genocide in Gaza and in support of Palestine, well... Nothing quite says which side you're actually on than that, does it? Well, let's bring things up to date with the letter Unite Members, instigated by activist Tony Greenstein, uh, that has been issued to Sharon Graham, which follows on from a very weak call for a ceasefire the Union finally issued on the 3rd of November. It is quite scathing, and I'm rather proud to be a signatory of it. It reads, Dear Sharon Graham, as a result of our letters of the 30th of October and 1st of November and other representations, including from London and Eastern Region, you finally agreed, after nearly four weeks of an ongoing genocide by Israel, to issue a statement on November 3rd calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. The statement was, however, pitiably weak. There was no mention of genocide or ethnic cleansing. There was no mention of the war crimes perpetrated by Israel, the bombing of hospitals, the targeting and murder of journalists, academics and doctors to say nothing of the bombing of residential areas or the murder of children, which now stands at over 8,000. There was no mention of the fact that Israel has imposed a food, water and fuel blockade on the Gaza Strip, resulting in starvation according to the United Nations. Collective punishment of a civilian population is an egregious breach of international law, yet the statement treats the Palestinians and the Israeli state as equally responsible. It is not Hamas which possesses an air force, but Israel. It is the Israeli state which is carrying out the carpet bombing of Gaza with the intent of forcing Palestinians out altogether. The statement treats the genocidal attack on the people of Gaza as equivalent to the breakout from the world's largest open-air prison on October 7th. Israel has occupied the Gaza Strip for 56 years, imposing a suffocating siege on it since 2007. This report from Vatican News of the 16th of December gives just one example of Israel's war crimes. Israelis have opened fire on Gaza's Christians following heavy bombardment overnight of the area around Holy Family Latin Parish in Gaza City. Dozens are reported dead and reports continue to arrive that shooting by Israeli snipers continues during these hours. A statement released by the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem confirmed that an Israeli sniper murdered two Christian women inside the Holy Family Parish where the majority of Christian families have taken refuge since the start of the war. An even more horrifying massacre took place on the 17th of December. Al Jazeera reported that Israeli bulldozers have crushed Palestinians who were taking shelter in tents outside Kamal Adwan Hospital. Dozens of Palestinians are reported to have been buried alive. These are Nazi-style massacres, and yet you have said nothing and done nothing since issuing your statement. You were, un you were happy to wave the Ukrainian flag, but you haven't waved the Palestinian flag or expressed any sympathy with the thousands of murdered Palestinian civilians, not least children. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres accepted that there was a context to October 7th. Many Israeli civilians died at the hands of the Israeli military. See Israeli forces shot their own civilians, Kibbutz survivor says. Unite at its 2023 policy conference passed motions supporting boycott, divestment and sanctions and affirmed that Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid. That should have informed Unite's statement. The statement treats one of the world's most powerful militaries and the resistance of the Palestinians as equal. Your claim that Israel's goal is to eliminate Hamas is untrue. Why bomb homes, schools and ambulances if that was the case? Were the dead children also Hamas terrorists? The statement says nothing about what Unite intends to do. You have done nothing to publicise all the previous national demonstrations. Are you going to ignore the one on January 13th too? 
There has been no national unite presence on the marches to date. We demand that you publicise all future demonstration, that you provide the resources necessary for Unite members to attend, that Unite nationally is present on the march together with its banner, and that Unite has a speaker at the rally. A leaked Israeli intelligence document makes it clear that Israel's intention is to repeat the Nakba in 1948 when three quarters of a million Palestinians were expelled. If Israel succeeds, this will be a prelude to ethnic cleansing on the West Bank where there has been a reign of terror in the past six months. Over 250 people have died since October 7th. Vast areas of Area C have been cleansed as Israeli settlers and the army attack farmers. None of this is recognised in your statement. Netanyahu has compared the Palestinians to Amalek, whom God instructed the Israelites to exterminate, yet United Statement ignores this. Open calls in Israel for the extermination of the Palestinians are being made, and Israel's army is doing just that. By blocking fuel, Babies on incubators and people on dialysis machines have already died. It is time for UNITE to show that the situation in Gaza is an urgent one and to mobilise its members. We give the Labour Party over a million pounds a year. We should be demanding that Keir Starmer makes way for someone who is not a Zionist without qualification. At the moment he is nothing more than Sunak's echo chamber. Sharon Graham and her team have succeeded in doing little more than infuriate members on the matter of Gaza and Israel. And it doesn't seem likely that's going to change anytime soon. Why, when she's clearly making herself unpopular in this, is beyond me. I don't know what she hopes to gain from it. Is her closeness to Keir Starmer leading her to ape his positions, which, as his letter sets out clearly, is just a reflection of Rishi Sunak's? She's been upsetting members seemingly from the get-go, and nothing has quite demonstrated the escalation of that than her facing a day in an Irish court. in the, Just due this month, I believe she's due in the dock, herself being accused of being a bad boss, a trade union leader, no less, being taken to court for the very thing trade unions are supposed to exist to stand against. Well, you should definitely watch this video next to get the details on that one. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks. Right, so that interview between Julia Hartley Brewer and Palestinian MP Dr Mustafa Barghouti that I covered in a video yesterday has gone viral for all the right reasons condemning it as one of the worst examples of gutted journalism going, of bias and of racism. The Palestinian politician could not get a word in edgeways, as the talk TV host made it all about herself and showed nothing but disdain for her guest. It was an extreme example of what so many in the media have been doing, though. Every interview seemingly beginning with those words, Do you condemn Hamas? When the atrocity being meted out by Israel in Gaza is so overwhelmingly disproportionate, it is insulting. Western mainstream media have been horrendous in their pro-Israel leanings, but so awful was this particular interview, so blatant and so foul in how it was conducted, what was asked and the attitude to the responses given, that the Palestinian response to it, following on, of course, from everything we've said on the matter in the West, as disgusted as we all have been, well, I reckon it might come as something of a surprise to you. Right, so that Julia Hartley Brewer interview has been heard around the world now, the interview that shook the world shocked and appalling pretty much everybody who has watched it as they say a lie has got itself around the world before the truth has got its boots on so to speak it was so bad news articles have literally been written about the interview such as in middle east eye which has covered demands for an ofcom probe into it for the record ofcom has stated that any program which prompts more than 50 complaints to it gets included in their weekly complaints bulletin which gets published every wednesday and that includes the actual number of complaints made so if you haven't done so, and you plan on having your say about Julia Hartley Brewer's conduct on Talk TV, then get on with making that complaint and make Ofcom blush with how big a number that might just be. Even mainstream media have covered this, from the Mirror to the Metro to the Huffington Post. They've all written articles on the conduct of Julia Hartley Brewer in this interview with a Palestinian MP. Naturally, plenty of people on social media have also weighed in with their opinions too. You can guess what a lot of them are saying. Literally millions of people, millions, have watched clips of Hartley Brewer screaming at Palestinian MP Dr Mustafa Barghouti. There are so many comments you do not have to look very far to find them, but this video isn't going to be about those comments. It's about the response from Palestinians themselves, from Palestine itself, to that interview. And who better, frankly, who is better placed to comment on it than Dr. Barghouti himself. He was on the receiving end of it, after all. Asked by a reporter in Ramallah in the West Bank yesterday for his response to that interview, yes, even in the West Bank, Haiti Spear's conduct has made the news right now, even with everything else they are currently dealing with.
Dr. Barghouti went ahead and said, This interview has essentially revealed the bias persisting since the beginning of the aggression on Gaza and perhaps for years, the strong Western media bias towards the Israel narrative. This interview exploded because we succeeded in presenting the strength of the Palestinian narrative and the painful truth that cannot be ignored or erased. This stems from the power of the Palestinian causes justice, which alarmed her remarkably. However, she revealed three things. An inability to hear the truth, as witnessed in a previous BBC interview where they cut the broadcast completely to avoid hearing the facts about the massacres committed by Israel. Secondly, she displayed a racist element, resorting to discussions about women and exhibiting deep ignorance in this area. Because anyone that knows me well knows that I am one of the biggest advocates of women's rights in general. This is a serious racist act comment, assuming that all Arabs, Muslims and Palestinians do not respect women. It is a dangerously racist statement. Thirdly, she demonstrated absolute unprofessionalism. No one in the world can conduct an interview in this manner. I interpret her explosion as a result of provocation due to her failure to cover the Palestinian narrative and the justice of the Palestinian cause. A fantastic reaction expanded globally. In my opinion, this interview has won us more international public opinion than hundreds of other interviews, because it is clearly exposing the bias of this type of Western media towards Israel blatantly and excessively. Extreme racism towards Palestinians became evident. This means she's now in a problem of her own making. So she isolated herself. And now there is an international campaign, as understood, demanding her dismissal with complaints to the British Journalist Union about her unprofessional and unacceptable behaviour. So, in Dr. Barghouti's opinion then, if I've read this correctly, Hartley Brewer's done them a favour? About the only thing he drew up short of was saying thank you to her. And who can blame him for not going quite that far when, as he put it, she was extremely racist. I think he's probably right. I think she probably has done Palestine a favour. Hartley Brewer stood there and encapsulated in one foul, screaming interview what I think a lot of the rest of the world think of Western media. I think she proved their point. And to anyone who was perhaps more ambivalent towards that, eyes might well have been opened and widened. I sincerely hope that's the case anyway. Most of all, of course, it is not so much around the world that attitudes towards our media need opening, but here in the UK. More and more people are advocating for not just alternative media sources and smaller independent media outlets for whom reputation becomes the difference between success and failure, unlike the big papers with their billionaire backers, a bad story there, a legal issue there, well, they can just weather that and take it on the nose. But the smaller ones, well, it can be the difference between that and collapse completely from people abandoning them. Reputation is everything. But foreign mainstream news as well is so good, so often covering British news in a much better, more honest manner. Our mainstream media, as I said, are billionaire owned. The people on them are paid stupid amounts of money. And if it wasn't all about the money at the end of the day, you wouldn't be seeing, for example, Tory MPs lining up for a gig on GB News, would you, and the like. Talk TV, we come back to Hartley Brewer's outlet, is Murdoch owned. It has virtually the entire leadership of Reform UK working for it, as well as Hartley Brewer. So beware of what you listen to and clearly who you vote for in that case. These pop-up Fox News rip-off stations that have come in the last few years are proving to be a really toxic addition to a media world already regarded as piss-poor by any measure of journalism. It's made all the worse when the likes of Hartley Brewer gets platformed as broadcasters elsewhere on other stations because then their views become more mainstreamed and become more believable. And what passes for news and discussion of news, both here and abroad, just gets polluted. I think Dr. Barghouti's response to Hartley Brewer, both on camera and afterwards in that interview with that reporter in the West Bank, were patient, were calm and were matter of fact. I think he's right that that interview can only have benefited the Palestinian cause as a result of things. And for that, all we pro-Palestinians, everybody right now who is standing with Palestine and wants a free Palestine, an independent state of Palestine, standing in solidarity with Gaza as Israel continues its genocide, can all say a big thank you to Julia Hartley Brewer for the favour she has done those people. And may we all wish she's off our screens permanently in the none too distant future, because she has nothing to journalistic discourse in our country, adds absolutely no value at all. And if you haven't seen the interview and want the details on it, and how truly terrible it was, delivered by yours truly on one of my videos here, you need to watch this video, of course, because it's here, 
and I'll hopefully catch you on the next bid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Keir Starmer, that Zionist without qualification, still can't form the word ceasefire for Gaza. The button marked, Israel has a right to defend itself, is firmly jammed on. So the only utterance is passing his robotic lips are ones very much in support of the occupiers and not the people whose territories they are occupying and who they are subjugating. Thankfully, not everyone is like him, though. Look at Yemen. Look at the Houthis, who are now giving their own lives to blockade Israeli shipping, with the US there to try and stop them from carrying on. Their little Operation Prosperity Guardians not working out quite as they wished, with several significant nations having dropped out. But hey, on the bright side, the Tories' joke of a defence secretary, today calling himself Grant Shapps, is all for targeting the Houthis with missiles, airstrikes. Let's take the fight to them. Let's spend money doing that. Not humanitarian aid or trying to bring this conflict to an end with BDS or embargoes of our own until Israel stopped committing ethnic cleansing. Oh, no, no. Let's just spend more arms, more public money to attack those who are standing up for Gaza and Palestine and Keir Starmer, the leader who can only lead when led by the nose or holding someone else's hand, who can't seemingly decide anything for himself without focus groups or consultancies, has looked at Grant Shapps of all people and said, yeah, I agree with him. Right, so Keir Starmer, Lord knows regular viewers will know I have pretty much nothing good to say about this horrible little man. This can't lead for toffee, overly ambitious sellout to the Israel lobby and anyone else who is prepared to give him their money, acquiescing to their whims and turning what was once a proper opposition party of the working class and for the working class into the Tory party B team, a bunch of red Tories in charge once more. He's been particularly ripe smelling when it has come to the matter of Israel though. Bought and paid for as he is by the Israel lobby, owes them everything, owes him his leadership. He will never hold Israel to account for what they do, no matter how heinous that might be. And right now, we're witness to some of the worst in living memory. And this dozy twonk couldn't even call for a ceasefire before the Tories went there first. And even when he did, it soon became clear it was more of an ambition that he hoped to see after more humanitarian pauses. Hand out some aid so that Gazans aren't at least being shot on an empty stomach. But given news from the World Food Programme has shown 90% of Gazans have less than one meal a day now, he can't even call for that properly. Some are who are demanding a full ceasefire and are going to inflict their own version of sanctions on Israel, of course, though, are the Houthis of Yemen using drones and speedboats and rockets of their own to put off shipping companies heading to Israel or coming from Israel, causing delays and interference and upsetting the Israeli economy somewhat. It wasn't until the US showed up that anyone actually died over this, and that was several boats full of Houthis themselves. They gave their lives to stop a genocide. The US took their lives apparently in support of that genocide. Actions speaking louder than words, after all. And when the US has blocked all political devices from the UN Security Council to bring about an end to the death and destruction, vetoing such matters each and every time, these actions speak very loudly. But of course, it isn't just the US wanting to take it to the Houthis right now, as the Tories do as well. Grant Shapps, if that is his name today, wants to join in with the US by mounting airstrikes on Yemen, saying the Houthis should be under no misunderstanding that they would be held accountable for unlawful seizures and attacks on cargo ships. Unlawful, he says. A bit like Israel's 56-year occupation and current genocide are then, eh? Well, back to Keir Starmer on this. He was doing the Sunday morning politics rounds himself this weekend, and on Sky News it was put to him. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has said at the start of this week that the UK was willing to take direct action in the Middle East. He was talking about Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. Do you agree with that? Well, as far as the UK goes, speak for yourself, Shapps. We should be sanctioning Israel too until they stop killing people, not threatening those literally doing that with conflict of their own. But Starmer, to little surprise to anybody, said, I agree with the government on this. I'm treading carefully because this is a sensitive issue and we are talking to the government on this. I had a COBRA briefing from the government on Friday about it. That's indicative of the approach I take. When Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, he and I had a private phone call that evening. And I said to him, we will robustly challenge each other up hill and down dale on most things. But on national security, on terrorism, on Ukraine, because that was a dominant issue then, we will stand as one. Same applies here. So when the government that has already made a statement in relation to what is already happening in the Red Sea, we support that. We will wait to see what next action needs to be taken. National security is the first concern of any government. 
It will be the first concern of an incoming Labour government, of course. And where action is needed, we are prepared to take it. What I don't want to do is sit here getting ahead of the government in an area where I've said, because it's so important, we will, wherever we can work together, so there is one voice coming out of the UK. Doesn't want to get ahead of the government, he says. You're an opposition leader, supposedly. That's exactly what you should be doing every single minute of every single day. You're a sheep man, a follower. The Tories lay things out and you agree with them. From the pandemic where you demanded the schools stayed open just like the Tories did, to this here and now. Consistently Keir Starmer following the Tory line and just like then as now, his choice is costing innocent lives. He has the nerve to mention this matter of striking Yemen as a national security issue to us when it is nothing of the sort. Our shipping in the Red Sea up until now isn't being affected, but you know what will change that? Attacking the people blockading the Israeli shipping. It's Israel today. The US is joining their list too now, I understand, unsurprisingly. Do you want us on the list as well? For what gain? So Israel can keep killing people in Gaza? Because that's what you're doing this for, isn't it? A ceasefire in Gaza is what it will take for the Houthis to pack up, stop and go home. It is that simple. Stop standing by while innocent lives are lost in Gaza and support Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. That's the diplomatic, responsible, international position to take. That would be leadership. Invoking national security here as a reason to support the Tories yet again in doing something that is reprehensible in the Middle East is insulting to anyone with half a brain. As for terrorism, well, if you want an example of that, how about Israel dropping white phosphorus on Gaza on numerous occasions against international law as it is, and just last night, they hit Lebanon with the stuff. Now, I realise you struggle with the concept of international humanitarian law, Keith. You were only a human rights barrister, after all. But wake up. Calling for a meaningful ceasefire and standing by that is the action you should have taken weeks ago. Not wringing your hands, waiting to see what the Tories do next before you inevitably just agree with them again. Honestly, I dread to think what the consultancy fees will be to the public purse if and when he becomes Prime Minister, because without somebody telling him what to do, he won't do anything. What the Houthis are doing and other nations who are perhaps taking a more diplomatic stance, but are nonetheless in agreement with regards their opinion of Israel and being on the side of Palestine and Gaza, notably many of the countries in this growing BRICS block of nations, 30,000 people are dead, the vast overwhelming majority of them completely innocent. The UK position seems to be that's not enough yet, because still a meaningful ceasefire call isn't coming from either side of the House of Commons. And this video here will tell you all about what Starmer is in total agreement over. Grant Shapps entering the Middle East pissing contest, frankly. I highly recommend watching it next, of course, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so this is a question that has often been asked over the last four years, and arguably more so since he was barred against the rules of the Labour Party rulebook from standing for the Labour Party again, singled out over that as he was. But is Jeremy Corbyn going to launch his own party now? The reason I ask is that all of a sudden there's been a bit of media chatter on the matter, with the London Economic, the Daily Fail, and GBBs, amongst others, all debating whether something is in the offing. Now is this more mischief on the part of the media to wind up a load of disenfranchised rotten lefties. Or is there some truth in the matter? Well, for my money, I'll believe it when it comes from Corbyn himself. But with an election all but certain at some point this year, should Corbyn wish to stand for Islington North again, he will have to walk away from the Labour Party to do so. He is still a member, we shouldn't forget. Just one with restrictions from standing for Parliament. So all eyes are on him doing something soon. But could it be a lot more than just standing as an independent? Right, so is Jeremy Corbyn going to start a new party? Would you join it if he did? And how would that affect the state of play as we see things politically right now? Well, this is one of those stories from Labour insiders, from sources close to Corbyn. So as much as we might love to see it, some of us anyway, it might all be a lot of mischief. But my goodness, in four years, to talk and hope that he would do something, it's never gone away, is it? Four years into being Labour leader, Keir Starmer, still afraid of him. In his speech just last week, where he was supposed to be setting out his stall and his vision and all that again, but ended up becoming all about Peter Mandelson, he still felt he had to put the boot into Corbyn, mention Corbyn and attack him as someone the party's moved on from, even though Corbyn's still a Labour member. We know things have moved on from those times, from the Labour leadership under Corbyn, moved on from hope and inspiration, as that has meant, this, to, the, to a vision of... This is the best you're going to get. It's the Tories are us. We're slightly less awful than them, but that'll be a matter of opinion, won't it? 
The centrists, of course, are already wailing that this will split the left vote. But if Corbyn launches something ready for the general election this year, which leaves very little time, in my opinion, but this is the mood music on the subject, then it could blow Labour's chances of a majority to hell. The old, you'll let the Tories back in excuse. Now, you know this is what centrists are saying, because anyone genuinely of the left will have already left Labour, probably, and will likely be pointing out that Starmer's bunch are just a load of red Tories, and for people that don't vote Tory, we're not going to back him anyway. This channel, for example. A large number of people have become disaffected and disenfranchised by Starmer and Labour under him. Won't vote for them, won't vote Tory either, won't vote Tory no matter what coloured ties they are wearing. The other parties are not necessarily appealing right now to everyone. Many of them will, however, have been enthused and inspired by Corbyn's vision for the country back in the day. That has been taken away from us by Starmer promising it all and abandoning every bit of it he ever stood for, killing the Corbyn project stone dead and the hope of a better country off entirely. Let's remember what we had offered up to us in that time under Corbyn. Free broadband, renationalisation of all of our utilities, privatisation stripped out of the NHS and a return to fully funding it, recruiting the NHS staff we actually need for it to run, a house building boom with emphasis on social housing, scrappage of tuition fees, the green industrial revolution, remember that one, creating thousands of new jobs in green industries and dealing meaningfully with the climate emergency, the national care service, sure start centres returning in every community, protect the pension triple lock, free bus passes, free over 75 TV licence, protect winter fuel payments, a real living wage that actually means, the, that is actually true to the words of that, the national education service, investment in schools and more and of course it is all possible because this country can we create the money to do it all if it chooses to tax the rich properly to offset that spending and not put the tax burden disproportionately on the shoulders of ordinary working class people because my goodness we've not seen any of that have we under the Tories that was on offer then of course so what is the crack about now what is on offer now apparently in this new Corbyn party vision well in 2019 a single issue did rather well in putting Boris Johnson in number 10 that was his oven ready turkey twizzler of a Brexit deal, the pack of lies that it was. It was nothing of the sort, just another Johnson lie. Corbyn is purportedly looking to stand on an anti war stance. Could that work just as well here and now? Well, the majority of the British public we know stand in stark contrast to both main parties who are right now, particularly on the matter of Gaza and Israel. Corbyn's pro Palestine stance of many years placing him at odds with the majority of MPs, but on the side of the mood of the majority of the British public. Moods are also shifting on the matter of Ukraine, not least because all of a sudden Israel seems to be more important to Western leaders. Corbyn the pacifist, Corbyn the negotiator. Corbyn would have demanded a ceasefire from the off. We all know it, whether you like Corbyn or not. People being killed helps solve nothing. Get people around the table talking ultimately is what works. And you know damn well that's exactly what he would have been advocating for. Sanctions, if necessary, along the way to pull those more interested in conflict into line. And right now we'd all be looking at Israel for that, wouldn't we? Why now, though? Why has it taken four years for Corbyn to perhaps come to this point? I think the answer to that lies in the very thing that destroyed him as Labour leader to begin with. All the mud slung at him. The one thing that eventually stuck was the anti-Semitism scam. And of course now we're perfectly comfortable calling it a scam, because that is exactly what it was in hindsight, what it's proved to be. It's been exposed. And again, Israel right now playing that card exposes the weaponization of it all the more. I'm prepared to risk my neck by saying I think an awful lot of people who once thought the worst of this lifelong anti-racist have changed their tune in the intervening years. I would humbly suggest Corbyn right now in the political landscape we have before us as well, the darth of hope and opportunity before us all, regardless of who wins the next general election, makes way for a man for whom hope became a byword for. If it does come to pass, and people within Labour complain about it, centrists moan about it, you can imagine James O'Brien crying into his cornflakes over this. They've only got their own leader to blame. Corbyn was cleared of any anti-Semitic intent or behaviour or conduct by the Labour Party itself, by the National Executive Committee. His subsequent expulsion and blocking from being allowed to stand as a Labour Party MP again was entirely the doing of Keir Starmer personally. The latter point, of course, having to be ratified by the Starmerite National Executive Committee, but he brought the motion. That wasn't democratic, that was a sham. If Corbyn starts a new party and scuppers their electoral chances, it is all on Starmer. All on him. 
Not on Corbyn. Anyone in this country has the right to stand for election. If you can't win votes or keep them with proper, decent, meaningful pledges and promises, then you never deserve them. None of which we can trust coming from Starmer now anyway. You deserve to lose your votes in that case, do you not? And so I suppose this brings me to what I can see coming to pass if this does indeed happen. I've always felt that if Corbyn stood as an independent, pretty much every politically homeless former Labour activist and their dog will descend on Islington North to campaign for him against whoever Labour put up. Perhaps a, a party he begins now, say, or in the next few weeks, would just be built around that, given how little time there likely is before the general election. If he opened it up more widely, though, to memberships, then what then? Well, I can see the website set up to do so crashing in minutes. It would. All those Labour members, Labour's lost, but all like me went to another party. Some of those may well leave wherever they went to, to stand with Jez once more. But you're talking hundreds of thousands of people, without exaggeration, joining on the spot. I've always said it. If Corbyn did this, he'd have a party to rival the main ones in terms of size and membership within days. Labour would likely see another massive drop of those who have hung in with their party regardless. No other politician I can think of in this country has the pull this guy does. He's chosen not to flex that until perhaps now, but in no way do I believe that has diminished. And if he can pull that membership in, along with the membership cash that comes with it, under him Labour needed no donors after all. It was totally self-sufficient. Unlike now where Starmer has chosen the way of the donor and not the voter, then why couldn't he have multiple candidates ready to stand around the country? Last time out, this guy was portrayed and sold to the public as a boogeyman, a racist, and a man who would bankrupt the country and make your life hell. Actually, everything they said he would cause has happened anyway thanks to the Tories. It's almost like capitalism is really the problem. And with Star more often than not agreeing with the Tories, nothing's going to change if the faces do. Seismic shifts don't happen often in our politics, but if Corbyn starts a new party, you'll have never seen anything like what I'm certain would happen next. If the media are making mischief and offering us all a little bit of hope where actually there is none, that's particularly cruel. And it could be the case. As I said at the start, when Corbyn says it himself, I'll believe it. But it really would be refreshing to have that injection of hope in our politics once again. And if I'm honest, and as unfair to him as this is in terms of pressure, there's literally nobody else who could do this. No one else could pull off what he could. Another reason that may have prompted Corbyn in this direction might have been a certain interview recently he did with Piers Morgan, harassed like mad to condemn Hamas as he was, as is the media line. They will, of course, try and come for him again. But surely we've learnt now. You should watch this video next to see an example of just how scared of Corbyn's return the establishment might be. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so, as we know, Israel are having a little bit of trouble with their shipping right now, aren't they? As the Houthis in Yemen target Israel's shipping traffic, passing through the narrow Babel Mandeb Strait, which forms the southern entrance to the Red Sea, and leads up to Israel's southern port of Lilat. The port has been practically shut down of late as a result of that, such has been the success of that Yemeni blockade, and shipping companies who are operating in and out of Israel have instead rerouted their operations, having to sail all the way around Africa so they can deliver to Israel via their ports in the eastern Mediterranean. But one of those has recently been the target of attack as well, and for a while it was something of a mystery as to who did that, but at last someone has put their hand up and admitted to it. It's not necessarily who you might think either. Right, so the Houthis in Yemen are still causing Israel a massive headache when it comes to their shipping. Well, if they would just stop their bombardment and genocide in Gaza, it would help, wouldn't it? It would all go away. But they won't. Netanyahu's career depends on that, and he places that above the economic well-being of his own country, as well as the notion of there ever being a Palestinian state. While well, the US have sent naval forces in to defend Netanyahu's career, in effect, against those supporting the people whose lands he and Israel occupy, Iran, having done likewise too, now offering Yemen some support in turn, Indeed, as the mainstream media keep telling us, those Iran-backed Houthis, but always neglecting to say Western-backed Israel in the name of impartiality as well, of course. Well, those actions by the Houthis, as we know, are causing Israel issues via their southernmost port of Eilat. It is driving Israeli trade around the coast of Africa, across the Mediterranean, in order to access the Israeli ports of Haifa and Jaffa instead. So Israel 
it is still able to trade, but it's taking quite the economic hit when all of its trade partners, particularly those in Asia and Australasia, are having to make a massive detour. Still, two accessible ports is better than none though, right? Well, I'm coming to that now, because the other day, the port of Haifa got hit by a missile. Now, the port of Haifa lies in Haifa Bay, on the northernmost edge of Israel's Mediterranean coastline. It's only about 30 miles from the border with Lebanon, and this strike on Haifa came just five days after the assassination of Sally al rori the Hamas leader targeted in a block of flats in southern Beirut, in Lebanon. It is assumed by Israel still to have done that, though they are still denying that. So the strike seemingly came out of nowhere, but being as close to Lebanon as Haifa is, Lebanon, Hezbollah, were seen as likely culprits. The targeting of another port, with Eilat running at very limited capacity because of the Houthis in the Red Sea, were others turning to Israel's other ports in the Mediterranean next. Israel, as is becoming very obvious, does not get on with its Arab neighbours. This is historic. It goes back to the formation of Israel itself by the West, as it was, a Western project, as it largely was, a Zionist political project also. The Nakba, the Six-Day War, occupying lands in Palestine and Syria, and at one point Egypt and Jordan as well, all make for a history of not making very many friends with those around you. Therefore, Israel's economy is massively dependent on shipping and trade with countries further afield. To blockade or put out a commission Israel's Mediterranean ports, as a lot has been in the south, would decimate their economy completely. So you can see why these make for good targets. But again, I'll make the point. If Israel would just stop its genocide and withdraw from Gaza, all this will stop. Instead, Israel have carried on and have been taking even more pot shots at having a go at both Lebanon and Syria as well now. How many countries can they go to war with at once? And why actually should the West keep supplying them with arms when they act like that and kill civilians indiscriminately as they do so? Even the US is getting pissed off with them for that at this point because the project must be kept going for their interests. But this is making them look awfully bad as well. Did you see that footage of Biden getting protested at most recently? It wasn't a good look for him having them all marched away and then saying, oh, I'm doing the best I can. You're not, sunshine, because you could stop, put a stop to this immediately. But you won't. You won't stop arming them either. And the same goes for everyone else who's still arming them as well. But to come back to that missile strike, as easy as it is to look at Lebanon, or Hezbollah more accurately, I should say, is almost certainly being responsible for the hit on Haifa. It wasn't them, because the responsible little party has now said, it was us! And actually, the missile strike came all the way from Iraq. Responsibility was claimed by the Irakat Hezbollah al nujaba resistance movement. Try saying that three times fast. It's easier to say Islamic resistance, isn't it? Which they also go by as they deployed a new long-range cruiser missile called the al Arkab as a direct response to the relentless massacres inflicted by the occupying entity on Palestinian civilians, including vulnerable groups such as children, women and the elderly. I think we can safely assume if Israel carry on, they can expect more to come from Iraq, which when you consider that Iraq lies beyond Jordan and Syria to the east of Israel, how quickly can they react to something from their coming? completely bypass them, it had to go through Jordanian airspace as well, and it managed to do that too. The Islamic resistance spokesperson Hussein al Musawi spoke to Lebanese al Mayadeen TV, which reported that the axis of resistance is determined to disrupt US scenarios in the region and thwart the occupying Israeli regime's schemes in Gaza, Musawi asserted. Masawi also underlined that the resistance front is capable of withstanding the ongoing battle for a long time, because of its resources and military potential. Yet another state actor on Israel's doorstep. I think it's fair to say that when Israel lies within Iraq's military reach and they've clearly spotted the weakness in Israel's economic reliance on sea trade, the Yemenis made it obvious by their blockade of the Red Sea how much it hurts Israel. The ports of Haifa and clearly Jaffa are within military strike range, so taking them out via airstrike would cause Israel colossal problems. In practice, while a blockade might be preferable and less damaging to these ports, there is, of course, the small matter of the UK military presence on nearby Cyprus, heavily used by the US as well right now. Why? Well, they won't tell us that, will they? But which would quickly deal with any blockade attempt on those Mediterranean ports, I am sure. So unfortunately, that leads to a more permanent, more damaging alternative in the form of airstrikes. 
Of course, the people who will suffer most if such things come to pass are the people, mostly innocent. Certainly most Israelis have been protesting the actions of their government here. Haifa was a warning shot. It's not like Netanyahu isn't being told. He's got it coming from all angles locally to Israel. I personally hope that the International Court of Justice orders a ceasefire off the back of the South Africa case beginning on Thursday and that Israel listen above all else because otherwise so many countries now in the Middle East are going to target Israel for not stopping their assault on Gaza. And how much more widely things could escalate from there I dread to think. Meanwhile as far as Iraq and Islamic resistance go they've been demanding the expulsion of the US from Iraq for some time. The US maintaining a presence there which on the same day as the strike on Haifa saw a US drone strike on Iraq's popular mobilization unit headquarters, which saw a new Java resistance leader killed along with two others. It's gone down like a lead balloon, it really has. Arrangements for the end of the US presence in the country are now being drawn up by Iraq's Prime Minister, uh, a chap called Mohammed al Sadani, and he said the attack was a dangerous escalation and a violation of Iraq's sovereignty. The mess in the Middle East just seems to be getting worse. The US is being no help whatsoever. It's getting to the point where a ceasefire from Israel would have further reaching benefits for more than just the people of Gaza right now. All eyes on South Africa and their genocide case on Thursday. The detail of their submission is as incredible as it is horrifying. And if you aren't up to date on what exactly South Africa are up to, then you should absolutely watch this video here next. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so everything Israel have done since October 7th has been, so we're repeatedly told by Israel, but certainly also by our mainstream media as well, that it's all been in retaliation for Hamas invading Israel, striking a music festival and the nearby agricultural settlements, the kibbutzes, where they also tell us Hamas committed horrendous acts of atrocity as they did so, much already debunked at that, when clearly they had no time to spend, for example, burning people alive. But people died at the hands of Hamas or Israel is up in the air and they did indeed but they did indeed take hostages that much we know but more and more scrutiny investigation of that night certainly is required to ascertain who exactly is responsible for those deaths but it has also revealed a great many of those deaths were caused by Israel themselves by admissions from Israel even they've admitted it even if they didn't necessarily mean to but further analysis by others either in the know from eyewitnesses to survivors or to experts in such matters are all pointing the finger of blame squarely at Israel and not at Hamas. So for how long can this carry on being ignored? Because although yes we're now counting down the days until the International Court of Justice opens proceedings on all of this but people are dying on a daily basis in Gaza still and it looks ever more possible that this is all based on a bigger and bigger lie in and of itself. Right, so there's no denying Hamas went into Israel and took hostages and people died in the process of that happening. There is blame on both sides in all likelihood, but given how disproportionate the response by Israel was on Hamas for that night, one night of incursion followed by three months and counting of genocide, it matters as more information comes out implying that more and more of the fatalities on the night of October 7th were due to Israeli actions rather than that of Hamas. The scale of the loss of life in Gaza has been immense. It's beyond comprehension. 30,000 people dead and counting. If Israel were responsible for more of the deaths on October 7th though, then what they are doing now is even more objectionable than previously thought. And let's remember here, Gaza and everyone in it, Hamas and non-Hamas affiliated alike, are prisoners of Israel. They have a right to resist that. Anyway, there's a few instances I want to talk about where Israel being at fault on the night of October 7th is now verifiable. Firstly, there was a gaffe by Netanyahu's mouthpiece and former Israeli ambassador to the UK, Mark Rizzo. His replacement hasn't been an improvement, has she? When questioned on US news channel MSNBC by Mehdi Hassan, though, regarding the number of Israeli deaths on the night of October 7th being revised down from what Israel had originally said previously, Regev said, We had the number at 1,400 casualties, and now we've revised that down to 1,200 because we understood that we had overestimated. We had made a mistake. There were actually bodies that were so badly burnt we thought they were ours. In the end, they were Hamas terrorists. Right, so there were 1,400 bodies 
but you accidentally counted 200 Hamas operatives amongst them because they were so badly burned. It took them six weeks to identify this error. But the biggest error on Mark Regev's part is the admission about the bodies being so badly burned. At no point did Hamas have the opportunity, or the time, or more importantly the means, to burn bodies. But with the IDF going in with their tanks and their gunships, they absolutely did. And there's also the small matter of Hamas. If they were able to, and inclined to burn people, probably weren't to burnt their own people, would they? It was an accidental admission of responsibility in effect. But that was just the start. Then there are the accounts of eyewitnesses and survivors. One Israeli kibbutz survivor recounted how several Hamas operatives entered her house where they ate some bananas. They then told her, don't worry, we're Muslim, we won't hurt you. And then they left. In her words, she said, they came in and I told them I have two children here. They look around and then one says to me in English, don't worry, I'm a Muslim, we won't hurt you. On one hand, it caught me by surprise. On the other hand, it took a lot of pressure off me. I sat down with my kids and the fighters brought chairs from the dining room. There was an armed fighter with us all the time and the rest were walking around the house. One of them sees bananas on the counter and asks, may I have one? And I say, yes, you can. She actually laughed as she recounted it to camera for Middle East Monitor. Then there was the account by one of the hostages taken by Hamas who was released. You might remember seeing some footage of this on the news. Even the mainstream showed a little bit of this. An 85-year-old woman who, when asked about her captivity and her captors, she was one of the first hostages released, you might remember. She said that she'd been treated kindly, promised they wouldn't be harmed, and ate the same food as that of the Hamas operatives. She actually shook hands as she was released with them and wished them peace as she went. Contrast that with opinions given by Israeli eyewitnesses again on the conduct of the IDF. A 44-year-old uh, mother of three called Yasmin Porat was interviewed on Israel's Channel 12 a week after the attack and she made the claim that Israeli citizens were killed by Israeli forces and not by Hamas. That these people died because of very heavy shelling and even tank fire. She said a Palestinian fighter who spoke Hebrew told her, look at me well, we're not going to kill you. We want to take you to Gaza. We're not going to kill you, so be calm. You're not going to die. Any notion that Hamas went into Israel with the intention of killing people seems to be false, based on these testimonies and many others like them. Their goal seems clear, to take hostages, presumably with an aim to get concessions of some kind from Israel. We know Israel destroyed houses with tank fire. We know helicopter gunships targeted people fleeing the Nova Music Festival also hit that night. There's footage of that online. Certainly the firepower Israel brought was more than capable of killing and incinerating, so those burned bodies Mark Regev talked about. I struggle to see how it can be proven that Hamas did that, without means to, and without motive, especially with the many accounts only ever talking contrary to that of the official Israeli line. And the latest source of food for thought on this has come from another surprising source, a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense called Chaz Freeman. In a video clip with a behavior analyst called Thomas Carrot, Freeman was asked about what he called the quite credible evidence that Israel was behind the deaths of Israelis on October 7th. And Freeman said, yes, and there are two reasons for this. One is the Israelis lack discipline and the training necessary to respond effectively to the hostage taking that Hamas carried out, which was aimed primarily at, by Hamas, at taking Israeli soldiers. The kibbutzim are garrisoned with soldiers. They are military settlements. Many of the people who live there, some of the women, are in the Israeli reserves, and Hamas sought to take them as hostages. Undisciplined fire by helicopters with hellfire missiles or by tanks with incendiary rounds directed at buildings is what happened, and this is a disgrace in military terms. The second reason is something called a Hannibal Directive. Israel has an enormous amount of Palestinian hostages, people that has put in prisons often with no charges, sometimes with fake charges. And many times in the past, Israeli hostages have been exchanged for Palestinian hostages in a vastly disproportionate ratio. So the Hannibal Directive basically says that rather than get into bargaining over a hostage exchange, you should just kill the Israeli hostages along with their captors. So an ill-trained army with orders to kill their own people in place, I've spoken about Hannibal Directives in other videos before, but the evidence from all manner of sources is casting more and more 
critical and condemnatory eye on Israel here. The court case will spell things out even more. These matters will become ever more clear in the days to come, I dare say. But Chas Freeman had a warning for Israel too. When people think of Israel in the past, they thought of it as a refuge for the victims of the Holocaust. Now they will think of it as the home of perpetrators of genocide. When they think of Israel, they will think of burned buildings and dead babies. This is an image problem of a fundamental nature. And from the point of view of Israel, it strips Israel of its protection by charges of anti-Semitism against anyone who is critical of Israel. Because to be critical of people who are carrying out genocide cannot be anti-Semitism. It cannot be considered immoral. Anti-Semitism is a despicable attitude, but to oppose genocide by Israel is not. How is history going to look back on these events? Is that going to change how people look at Israel and think of it in the days and years to come? It's every danger of that from their perspective. Roll on the court case beginning on Thursday. I really hope we're going to get an interim order for a ceasefire quickly, as is South Africa's plan. They got a massive endorsement for their efforts the other day, incidentally. You should watch this video to hear all about that, though. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so on both sides of the Atlantic, there seems to be some seriously squeaky bums ahead of court proceedings opening tomorrow at the International Court of Justice at The Hague. As far as the US goes, we've had the spectacle of Genocide Joe being heckled and his Israel devotee sidekick and Chief of State Anthony Blinken has been on a mass flesh-pressing exercise around the Arab world, clearly in panic mode, that if Israel get found guilty of genocide, they'll be guilty of aiding and abetting and they need to drum up a bit of local support. But here in the UK, a similar case of squeaky bum time has come as David Cameron reluctantly admits that Israel probably is committing genocide in a textbook show of Tory idiocy, because at the same time said there will be no cessation of arms sales to the region either. Nothing quite says aiding and abetting quite like admitting there's law breaking going on whilst helping Israel to keep on doing it, is there? The man made an idiot of himself, hiding behind legal advice, which has now instigated a Labour backbencher, not Starmer, obviously, he's gone into hiding again, to call a motion asking to see the legal advice the government are apparently following on these matters. That will be fun if it passes. Meanwhile, undermining our government further is news that Jeremy Corbyn has joined with South Africa in supporting their case against Israel, and before the likes of uh, James O'Brien or the Labour Friends of Israel can squeal anti-Semite over that, a member of the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament itself, has now announced that they're going to do likewise. Side with prosecution against their own country. Lots to cover as sphincters are clenching the whole world over. Right, so a lot of different stories all relating to the same thing. So let's tie everything together because ultimately everything I've described in my intro is leading up to that big South Africa brought genocide case against Israel beginning tomorrow. The eyes of the world will be on it, so stick with me, I'll be covering it all. But first, let's have a look at Israel's apparent best friend, the US. We all saw Biden get heckled the other day for allowing this genocide to continue. That nickname of Genocide Joe will haunt him for the rest of his days, of that I'm certain. But seeing all of his supporters standing there braying four more years in response to people highlighting the Israeli attacks perpetrated using predominantly US armaments was a sickening sight to see. This isn't about internal US politics and who is president next or who stays as president. It's about the here and now and what's happening in Gaza. But that's liberals for you. More than that, though, has been the Middle East flesh-pressing mission amongst the Arab states of the Middle East being carried out by Secretary of State Antony Blinken, a guy who has bent over backwards to excuse what Israel are doing. Between these two men, Blinken and Biden, the power lay or well, the paralyzed to end this genocide. They can exert the pressure on Israel to stop it immediately. They've chosen not to. Worse, Blinken has decided to go around touring Qatar, Turkey, Crete, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and of course Israel, obviously. He's got to stop by there as well. The only reason he's done that here and now, this suspiciously convenient timing, is for Israel's sake, of course, in the face of those genocide charges that they face. In fact, he's been happily he snapped on camera with Israeli President Isaac Herzog just yesterday. He who was recently signing missiles ready to be dropped on Gaza. Well, Herzog said to Blinken, while stood there on stage, 
This is your fourth trip already in this Gaza war, and we are very grateful to you for your support and steadfast commitment to Israel's safety and to make sure that Israel wins this war. On Thursday, a proceeding will start in the International Court of Justice in The Hague, whereby South Africa has sued Israel for supposedly genocide. There's nothing more atrocious and preposterous than this claim. And here with the hypocrisy of South Africa, we will be in the International Court of Justice and we will present proudly our case of using self-defence under our most inherent right under international humanitarian law. Resorting to insults in the face of being accused of genocide is not a good look. South Africa's present is one of learning the lessons from its history. That's not something Israel can say it's done. And that history makes them arguably better placed to take this forward than any other country. They know apartheid when they see it. They live through it. They had to deal with it themselves. And they've come out the other side. I look forward to hearing that defence from Israel, though it needs to be quite something because South Africa's 84-page submission to the ICJ is astonishing. And the legal team they put together is fearsome. So that's the US right now, still ardently standing by a very bullish Israeli government. Here in the UK, nerves might be fraying a little bit more. David Cameron, our completely unelected foreign secretary, got it got dragged kicking and screaming from him by the Foreign Affairs Select Committee that Israel might be in breach of international law. It was actually a masterclass in how to tackle evasive Tories under questioning because Cameron is supposedly the nation's top diplomat right now, acting on behalf of the UK. And he really does not have a bloody clue what he is doing. And there were several instances of improving this, but his stupidest moment was easily when the SNP MP Brendan O'Hara put to him, one of the things you said a moment ago, and I quote, one of the things we'd like the Israelis to do is switch the water back on. Now that says that they turned it off. It says that you recognise they have the power to turn it on. Therefore, isn't turning water off and having the ability to turn it back on, but choosing not to, isn't that a breach of international humanitarian law? The answer, of course, is yes. But to Cameron, it was just something they ought to do and clung to the fact he wasn't a lawyer in order to avoid saying that obvious answer of, yes, well, guess what, Dave? You were literally sat next to a lawyer. Not only that, but if it isn't clear to Cameron that denying people basic access to water, as is laid down in humanitarian law, human rights law, gen genocide convention, Geneva conventions, then what have you been doing since getting your lordship and taking a post, Sunak, has no talent on his own benches, elected talent on his own benches, to fulfil the role, except practising being even more condescending than ever. The chair pulled said lawyer, Sir Philip Barton, up on this for clarification and pressed him for a yes or no answer on this. And he also sat there obfuscating that they were, talk they were talking technicalities because it's an obligation over occupying powers. And all of a sudden, nobody seemed to realise that Israel was an occupying power. 56 years of occupation came as one. I love a shot to Cameron and his team. They didn't see that coming. Well, who knew? You used to be the Prime Minister, man. You should have known. It was insulting how ill-prepared and frankly how stupid they take us for. That they wouldn't admit that they were in the wrong. Beyond Cameron eventually wheedling that he was worried Israel might have broken international law. But on the matter of South Africa bringing this case, he said, I don't think that is helpful. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's right. Well, on what basis, though? What legal advice brought you to that startling conclusion, Dave? Ah, well, they aren't too keen to share that, so a motion has had to be brought to Parliament seeking to get it published. Labour backbencher John Trickett, one of the few Labour MPs worthy of the name Labour MP, a good guy, has tabled an early day motion demanding to see the legal advice. That's legal advice, incidentally, that David Cameron can't remember if he's seen or not, making him either dishonest or incompetent, but I'm plumping for both. Anyway, Trickett's motion reads that this House understands that questions have been raised internationally about the legality of the Israeli government's actions in Gaza, recognises that in November 2023, UN experts raised the alarm about the risk of genocide in Gaza, highlights the UN General Secretary's reasons for invoking Article 99, that there is a high risk of total collapse of the humanitarian support system in Gaza, which would have devastating consequences. Further highlights his comments to the Security Council that international humanitarian law includes the duty to protect civilians and to comply with the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution, and that the laws of war also demand that civilians' essential needs must be met, including by facilitating the unimpeded delivery of humanitarian relief.
notes the Spanish Prime Minister's comments that he has serious doubts that Israel is complying with international humanitarian law, further notes the letter signed by prominent Israeli public figures to the Attorney General in December 2023, which said there have been explicit calls to commit atrocious crimes against millions of civilians, providing evidence of the discourse of annihilation, expulsion and revenge, acknowledges the case South Africa has brought to the International Court of Justice, claiming Israel's treatment of Palestinians is tantamount to genocidal actions, and calls on the government to publish in full the legal advice it has received from its law officers regarding the situation in Gaza, particularly in the run-up to UN votes and the legality of the UK export licensing of arms to Israel. Bring it on. It's telling that this had to come from a backbencher in the Labour Party, though, to try and glean some information on this, because neither Starmer nor any of his front bench seem at all interested. Basically on the same page as usual as the government are, therefore providing no checks and balances as an opposition is supposed to do, failing in their job. So far, only a handful of MPs have signed this early day motion of Trigget so, so get hold of your MP to do likewise. It's not just Labour backbenchers here trying to hold the government to account over the UK position on Israel and South Africa, though. There are others on the same page. And no doubt, having the centrists wailing into their morning lattes is news that Jeremy Corbyn is formally supporting South Africa's case against Israel. The race card will be played again, of course, on this against him, as always. But really, is it still cutting through now? Not only is he supporting the case, he's joining South Africa's delegation tomorrow at the ICJ for the two days of hearings scheduled this week. In fact, such is the weight Corbyn's presence offers that of all the foreign political figures South Africa claims are amongst their delegation, he was the one that they chose to name. Is that out of prominence as as how well he's known or is it because he's been proven right time after time with his long track record of support for Palestine and being critical of Israel should South Africa prevail in which case it'll be another example of Corbyn was right won't it but before anyone chooses to start braying anti-semitism over this there is one other politician we know of that is joining with South Africa this one possibly carries more weight even than Corbyn because a member of the Israeli Knesset itself Israel's parliament is joining the South Africa delegation. Ofer Kassif of the left-wing Hadash Ta'al party, I've probably said that wrong, announced on Sunday that he was joining in the lawsuit against his own country in The Hague. He said, My constitutional duty is to Israeli society and all its residents, not to a government whose members and its coalition are calling for ethnic cleansing and even actual genocide. Those who hurt the country and the people are the ones who led South Africa to turn to The Hague, not me and my friends. I will not give up the struggle for our existence as a moral society. That is true patriotism, not wars of revenge and calls for destruction, not unnecessary bloodshed and not the sacrifice of civilians and soldiers in futile wars. Can you imagine the courage that took to stand up in the parliament of the very people perpetrating this genocide and saying to their faces, I'll see you in court. I'm with South Africa because that's basically what he did and they went mad. I did a video the other day talking about one of Netanyahu's ministers, Tali Gottlieb, and she was storming around the Knesset floor, waving papers and screaming at Kassif over this. The far right are now planning to demonstrate outside of his house over it and one of the rancid bunch has even produced a Photoshop image to promote this protest of an Israeli MMA fighter holding Kassif's severed head and another member of Netanyahu's Likud party, Nisim Vachiri, holding a hammer. So if anything happens to him or his family, that's going to be on Netanyahu as well. The lead up to this court case is not settling down any at all. If anything, things are just getting more febrile. And if you aren't familiar yet with the 84 page submission by South Africa that has kicked off all of this fuss, so much fuss and attention that has got the eyes of the world glued to The Hague right now, then you really need to watch this video next. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so what would the consequences for Israel be if South Africa end up winning their case at the International Court of Justice? As we await the beginning of South Africa's case against Israel on the grounds of genocide beginning in The Hague tomorrow, the foremost legal expert in successful prosecutions under the Genocide Convention and that's because he's the only lawyer to ever succeed in winning sanctions against a nation state for committing genocide in the history of the Genocide Convention, a chap called Francis Boyle, uh, who is certain that South Africa will win their case against Israel. So he was asked what the 
legal consequences would be for Israel following a defeat in court and what could actually follow. What could happen next? And as much as these things are far from certain, and as much as we can expect some form of pro-Israel bias to creep in somewhere, because it always seems to, let's take a look at where this will leave Israel and those supporting it, aiding and abetting in genocide, following a successful ruling for South Africa. Right, so Francis Boyle, the only lawyer to mount a successful prosecution under the Genocide Convention when he took Yugoslavia to the World Court over its genocide of Bosnia-Herzegovina, has weighed in on the prospects of South Africa succeeding against Israel at the International Court of Justice. And I covered much of what he had to say the other day in another video. But as much as we're hoping that South Africa win, what will happen next if they do? Obviously, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. The hearings don't begin until tomorrow. But if the eminent Francis Boyle is prepared to stick his neck out and say South Africa has got this, especially when he's read the court filings and gone through them all as you'd expect a lawyer to do with a fine tooth gun, we might as well see where things would go afterwards if this is indeed the likeliest scenario in his opinion. So say a cease and desist order gets handed to Israel to end its genocide as Francis Boyle believes will happen. This will have serious consequences for Israel. For one, there's its reputation. Before we even get into the legality and the consequences of that, reputation-wise, the entire world will then know that Israel's committing genocide against Palestinians. Their name will be mud. A court will have ruled on that. The world court at that will have ruled on that. Frankly, anyone wanting to do trade or business with Israel at that point, despite that ruling, well, they aren't somebody you'd want to do business with, are they? You wouldn't want to buy their products, would you? But... You know they'll be there, there'll be some. But at this point, all other countries signed up to the Genocide Convention under Article 1, or under the terms of Article 1, will then be obliged to act to prevent that genocide. So basically, if Israel decides to ignore the order, the judgment, all other signatories to the Genocide Convention will be obliged to act in a manner in accordance with stopping them in some way from doing what they're doing, from carrying on committing genocide. By law, they will have to stand with Palestine against Israel until the genocide stops, in effect. Anyone not doing so would be in violation of Article 1, whether that be by siding with Israel or sitting on their hands. Siding with Israel, then, as would be the case during the court case starting tomorrow, would be aiding and abetting, which is criminalised under Article 3 of the Genocide Convention. So there could be ramifications for the likes of the US, certainly it seems, the UK in all likelihood as well, yet to follow. That would be separate litigation, of course. The easiest way to meet that obligation to enforce the Genocide Convention, to enforce the World Court ruling, is for the order to be delivered by the World Court to, by South Africa, then to the United Nations and to the UN Security Council for them to vote on it for enforcement. Well, Security Council again, here we have the US faced with a stark choice. They can continue to add to any potential future case built against them for aiding Israel in committing genocide uh, under Article 3 by using that blasted veto of theirs again, which would kill off any enforcement of an international court of justice ruling by the Security Council. Massively dangerous to do and its implications for global justice, of course, because ignoring and voting down such a legal ruling would render world justice a joke, wouldn't it? There would be no such thing in effect. It would also be in direct violation of the terms of the UN Charter, which the US is also, of course, a signatory of. Unfortunately, Francis Boyle believes this is exactly what the US will do because of their track record up until now. They might surprise us. They might abide by the ruling and do the right thing, in which case enforcement is handed down and Israel really had ought to stop. But we'll come back to what if they don't in a moment. But even if the US do veto it at the Security Council, as we've seen already, there's another way. By then taking the court order to the General Assembly instead and having all UN nations vote through the enforcement under the Uniting for Peace resolution. That we would expect to pass, and that would then carry with it potential consequences for Israel at the UN itself, never mind just enforcement of the legal notice. So what could the UN do then, Damo? They seem rather toothless most of the time, don't they? Well, for one, the UN could suspend Israel as a member state from participating in UN activities. It wouldn't be the first time this has been done. South Africa themselves were suspended in such a way during the apartheid years there. Yugoslavia was also suspended by the UN for their genocidal actions in the Balkans. The very case Francis Boyle was successful in personally. So there's precedent for this. What could the UN do for Palestine? Well, at the moment, Palestine is a UN observer state, one of two, along with the Vatican City, which basically means it is recognised as a state and can, as it stands now, speak at the UN, as we have seen them do on numerous occasions, 
often most recently at failed UN Security Council votes. But they themselves do not have a vote in anything at all. Well, the UN General Assembly can change that by admitting Palestine as a full member state, making it a lot more difficult for certain nations to refuse to recognise Palestine as a state in its own right, such as us here in the UK, who still refuse to do so. This is something that would have to be voted on, but the votes are almost certainly there for this to pass. Given that we're witnessing ethnic cleansing and a desire to wipe Palestinians out, giving Palestine full member status would make it a lot harder for Israel to pretend it is doing anything other than trying to eliminate another, by then, UN member, with equal rights and status at the UN to themselves. This would offer Palestine additional protections that it doesn't have right now. In addition to that, the UN General Assembly could seek to take action in order to prosecute high-ranking Israeli figures for genocide. You can imagine somebody like Netanyahu would be high up on that list, can't you? They do that by setting up an international criminal tribunal, as again was previously done for Yugoslavia, under the terms of their UN Charter permitted under Article 22 of the UN Charter, which states, the General Assembly may establish such subsidiary organs as it deems necessary for the performance of its function. Short and sweet article, that one, isn't it? The International Criminal Tribunal would be a subsidiary organ, as described in that article. A working group, in effect, which could begin the matter of prosecuting high-ranking Israeli officials for genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity committed against Palestinians. This could range from politicians to members of the IDF. The scope is huge, given what we're witnessing, and of witnessed since October 7th, which is what South Africa have concentrated on in their ICJ submission. But of course, follow-up litigation could come, may follow suit, and that could go back a lot further. And then there is the matter of sanctions. The UN can recommend these too, just as embargoes were imposed on South Africa over apartheid once upon a time. I just about remember these things as a child. Israel can little afford more economic sanctions. The Houthis in Yemen already have had a significant impact on their economy that way. Further sanctions, they could do without. But the Houthis could down tools should sanctions be imposed. Unfortunately, it's the UN Security Council again that has to impose sanctions. The General Assembly can only recommend them. So again, there's a risk the US will veto any recommended sanctions. But again, they would be seen to be aiding and abetting Israel by going against a UN recommendation and a court order. Just how far are the US prepared to go? Will they face a day in court themselves for doing so? Well, that would be a whole other court case. But if they carry on down this road, the risk of genocide Joe and co having a day in the Hague too has to be increasing one by that point. Has to be an increasing one by that point. That said, again, it could come back to the General Assembly under the Uniting for Peace resolution that sanctions be imposed too. The sanctions against North Korea right now were put in place via this route. So it's got precedent as well. All in all, a court order really would open up new avenues for the UN to take in bringing Israel to book. But of course, we have to get that ruling first. The US are talking to everyone and anyone they can to try and swing things for Israel, even now, as sickening as that thought is for so many of us. What is helping them is that the current president of the ICJ, Joan Donoghue, is American, and has been described by Francis Boyle as a career-long State Department apparatchik and legal hatchet person. So that's reassuring, isn't it? He's certain that she's feeding the US government information about what is going on behind the scenes right now at the ICJ. And she also has the power to shape how the proceedings go, which could favour Israel and the US. Seems likely to, in it together as they very much seem to be. You can look at it this way. If the US can't scupper this, they are probably heading to The Hague themselves at a later date for complicity. Nonetheless, the evidence is all on South Africa's side. Things get going tomorrow. I will be covering this. In the meantime, check out why that is the case by watching this video next, explaining how Israel's defense has already been torn apart before they've even got to The Hague. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so Israel's genocide case began today in The Hague with the testimony from South Africa today. Israel had their turn to defend themselves tomorrow. There should be no underestimating how big an event this is, how huge a court case like this is, making it all the more risible for so many of our media outlets today, from the BBC to Sky to CNN to ABC, are downplaying it, ignoring it even. So much so, they haven't even opted to televise any of it. Though it remains to be seen if they do that tomorrow, when it is Israel's turn. 
Thankfully, the International Court of Justice were streaming it themselves, and, and Al Jazeera showed it as well in full, so people could get around that mainstream ignorance. It's also a huge case because this is the Hague, for heaven's sake. To even be taken to the Hague in this day and age, if there's no case to answer, things don't escalate to the international stage, do they? And if the mass media think they can just cover bits of what happens tomorrow and downplay the events of today, they are sorely mistaken. Because the team of lawyers South Africa assembled, who took turns in speaking on various aspects of the case in a three-hour-long hearing, came prepared. Boy, did they come prepared. And when the opening statement came, claiming Israel had no defence against accusations of genocidal intent, and frankly, Western media and Western politicians are on trial here too, because should South Africa prevail and the case they laid out was forensic and devastating in equal measure, it is going to reflect horribly back on them, especially here in the UK with the general election coming up. Who wants to vote for a genocide enabler? Right, so South Africa began the two-day proceedings at the International Court of Justice at The Hague this morning. It will continue tomorrow when Israel had their say, mount their defence, whatever form it may take. Many of us expect it to be full of excuses, but if that is the case... Following on from the judicial masterclass South Africa's representatives put on today, they will be insignificant bother. Three hours is a lot to condense into a not overly long video. I've focused on key moments as much as possible, the bits that stood out for me at any rate, and even then it's hard to whittle this down, because the testimonies given were as compelling and damning as they were horrifying to hear and see in the footage they used, though they went to great pains to avoid using those graphic video clips that they could easily have used, because they want the facts to speak for themselves, not be lost amongst imagery which is too easily fixed upon and all people end up remembering. As I said a moment ago, there's a team of lawyers involved. They all took different aspects of what it takes to prove genocide in a court of law to discuss, but certain elements definitely stood out. And the first lawyer to speak, Adila Hassim, set out the genocidal acts Israel have committed. This is where South Africa decided to start at, get the atrocities out there, and it all built up from there. I seen Bilter's speech around the case of Israel breaching Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, bearing in mind the legal definition of genocide means to intend to destroy in whole or in part an ethnic or religious group, and which comprises five points, labelled A to E, which are killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures to prevent births and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And she gave example after example after example of all of these points being met. The occupation of Gaza has been in place since 1967. Almost half of the population of Gaza are children and they are being killed by Israeli forces from land, sea and air. All are at immediate risk of starvation and dehydration and disease as a result of the mass destruction. The lack of aid and crucially the impossibility of distributing that aid as bombs still fall. All of this renders the right to life impossible. So in violation of Article 2A on killing members of the group, Hassim gave evidence on the mass killing of people in Gaza and used the words of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. There was nowhere in Gaza to hide that was safe. 23,210 Palestinians have been officially killed in sustained attacks over the last three months, 70% of them women and children. A further 7,000 Palestinians are missing presumed dead. People in Gaza have been subjected to relentless bombing, killed in homes, shelters, hospitals, schools, mosques, churches, and as they try to find food and water. They have been killed if they fail to evacuate, yet they have also been killed even when they have evacuated and when they've been told to go, and even when they tried to flee along Israeli declared safe routes. Bodies are buried in mass graves, often unidentified. In the first three weeks, 6,000 bombs were deployed per week, and at least 200 times Israel had deployed 2,000 pound bombs in areas designated as safe. Israel had decimated the north of Gaza, including refugee camps, and the largest, most destructive bombs available have been dropped by fighter jets owned by one of the world's most well-resourced armies on a captive population. Israel have killed unprecedented numbers of civilians, with knowledge of how many lives each 2,000-pound bomb is capable of taking when they choose to deploy them on a given area. Multiple family members have been killed, multi-generational families wiped out, often all killed together. Grandparents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, no one is spared, not even newborns. Child killings in Gaza have been so extensive 
Gaza has been described as a graveyard for children. There is no humane justification in these acts. On Article 2b, the matter of causing bodily or mental harm on the people of Gaza, attacks have left 60,000 Palestinians wounded and maimed, the majority again women and children. Healthcare has all but collapsed, children are arrested, blindfolded, stripped and taken to unknown locations, therefore the physical and mental suffering is undeniable. On Article 2c, Hassim said Israel were deliberately imposing conditions that did not sustain life, done in four ways. Displacement, forcing the displacement of about 85% of Gazans. There is nowhere safe for them to flee to. They will be killed or be at extreme risk of being killed. And many Gazans have been displaced multiple times as families are forced to move repeatedly. One million people on a forced move from North Gaza to South. Entire hospitals were required to evacuate, including babies in intensive care, and they were given 24 hours to do so. That order itself was genocidal. Immediate movement, no humanitarian assistance, fuel, water and food were cut off. It was calculated to bring about destruction of the population. Israel has now damaged or destroyed the homes of some half a million Gazans who now have nowhere to return to. Infrastructure has been razed to the ground. No indication that Israel accepts responsibility for rebuilding what they destroyed. Instead, they celebrate it. Soldiers celebrate it. They've been seen flying Israeli flags in the rubble. Hassim's second point here was that with forced displacement, designed to cause widespread hunger and starvation, this is now pushing people to the brink of famine. 90% face crisis levels of hunger. More than 80% of the global population suffering hunger right now are in Gaza. More may die from starvation and disease than the airstrikes do. Yet Israel continues to impede aid into Gaza, but is also removing the means to distribute it as well. On the 8th of January, a planned mission by UN agencies to deliver medical supplies and fuel to a medical supply centre was denied by Israeli authorities. Five hospitals in northern Gaza are without supplies and equipment, and Israel is keeping it that way. Aid trucks are seized upon by the hungry, and what is supplied is not enough. Hassim's third point was that Israel has inflicted conditions denying access to adequate clothes, shelter and sanitation. Clean water is all but gone. Soaring rates of disease outbreaks continue. Diarrhea amongst under fives has increased 2,000%. And it's a well-known fact that malnutrition and disease create a deadly cycle. And Hassim's fourth point on this aspect of Israel's actions was that the military assault on Gaza's healthcare system has rendered life unsustainable. Healthcare infrastructure in Gaza has been completely obliterated. The US Special Rapporteur on Health has said the healthcare system in Gaza cannot cope with the scale of injuries. On Article 2D, Adila Hassim brought up another UN Special Rapporteur, the one for women and girls, who had warned about the reproductive violence inflicted on women, children and even newborn babies, intended to prevent births within the Gazan group. Israel have been blocking medical aid, including the kits needed to deliver babies. Women are giving birth in Gaza each day, and 15% are likely to experience complications where the care needed is simply not available. All these acts individually and collectively form a pattern of conduct by Israel of genocidal intent. By specifically targeting Gaza, using weaponry causing widespread destruction, designating safe zones and then bombing them, Depriving Gazans of basic needs like food, water, healthcare, communication, sanitation, as well as destroying infrastructure like homes, schools, hospitals, churches and more. Killing seriously, injure, well, killing seriously injuring and leaving many children orphaned. This is all a pattern of conduct and related intention justifying a plausible case of genocide. Hassim then brought up the example of the case of the Gambia against Myanmar on the basis of genocide and the, the ICJ didn't hesitate to impose provisional measures in relation to accusations of genocide against the Rohingya in that instance. Every day there is mounting irreparable loss of life, dignity and infrastructure. Nothing will stop the suffering except an order from the court because without an order the actions will continue, especially in light of Israel saying their actions will continue for at least a year. They've gone on record and said that. And that was the testimony of just the first lawyer Making the case against Israel for genocidal intent came lawyer Tembika Unkatobe. He said it was evident from how military attacks are being conducted, systematic mass displacement, headed into areas where Gazans continue to be killed and deliberate conditions created by Israel to cause death. There is a clear pattern of conduct. 
the targeting of homes and infrastructure, laying waste to vast areas of Gaza, sniping of men, women and children, the lack of access to humanitarian assistance. 1% of the population of Gaza has now been killed. One in four have been injured since October 7th. All of this is evidence of genocidal intent in whole or part of the civilian population. But he brought up another extraordinary feature in this particular case as well, in that the political leaders and military commanders have declared their genocidal intent. These are repeated by soldiers on the ground, and it's all rooted in the belief that, in fact, the enemy is not just the military wing of Hamas, or Hamas generally, but embedded in Palestinian life. Netanyahu has declared war on Gaza. He is quoted as having said on October 7th, Israel has started clearing out the communities that have been infiltrated by terrorists and warned of a price to be paid. There are 2.3 million people in Gaza and Israel is the occupying power in control of Gaza, everything that goes in and out, even down to the permitted internal movements of the people who live in Gaza. Netanyahu has overall control of the IDF and in turn, therefore, the people of Gaza. On the 28th of October, Netanyahu urged the soldiers to remember what Amalek had done to them, the biblical reference to the wiping out of the Amalekites according to the Bible. Invocation to Amalek was repeated in a letter from Netanyahu later to his armed forces. Yoav Gallant, the defence minister, gave an update that there would be no electricity, no food, no water, because Israel is fighting human animals. He said that he has unleashed all restraints to eliminate everything. The theme of destruction of human animals, the language of dehumanisation is here. This is a widely held view in Israel. Hamas and civilians are guilty in equal measure. Orders to destroy and maim what cannot be destroyed. These things were said by people in positions of authority in the Israeli state. These direct the actions and objectives of the people on the ground, the IDF, etc. Unkatobi then showed some video footage of Israeli soldiers singing and hugging and dancing in a circle. And the words they were singing were, I'm coming to occupy Israel and beat Hezbollah. I stick by one mitzvah to wipe out the seed of Amalek. I left home behind me, won't come back until victory. We know our slogan, there are no uninvolved civilians, echoing the words of Netanyahu, filmed dancing, chanting and singing. Now there is a trend for soldiers to film themselves committing atrocities. And more video footage was shown of one soldier filming themselves as they detonated 30 houses in one go. A whole skyline nearly of what were clearly homes blown up. And they ended their video by saying, long live Israel. Other reports stated that soldiers sang about destroying Khan Yunus. Israeli journalists have said the woman is an enemy. The baby is an enemy. The pregnant woman is an enemy. That it is necessary to turn the strip into a slaughterhouse to demolish every house soldiers come across and exterminate everyone. Failure to control their media rhetoric is also genocidal intent on behalf of the Israeli government. A distinctive feature of this case is that it has not been silent on genocidal intent, but instead there has been reiteration and repetition of it. Unkatobi concluded by reminding the court of the genocidal inciters, the Prime Minister, the President, the Minister of Defence, the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, members of the Knesset itself, the Israeli Parliament, senior army officials and the foot soldiers as well. Genocidal rhetoric is not therefore in the fringes, but is in fact state policy. Therefore, the evidence of genocidal intent is not only chilling, it is overwhelming and incontrovertible. Before I move on to the interim order South Africa is seeking a quick decision on, the case of genocide itself against Israel could take years to get to, I want to pick up on the testimony of one other lawyer, Blenny Nigrale, who spoke on the urgency of the situation. The situation in Gaza is described as a crisis of humanity, a bloodbath of unmatched horrors, denied access to the essentials for survival on an unimaginable scale. Gaza has become a place of death and despair, sleeping in the open as temperatures plummet. People relocated have come under bombardment. Medical facilities have come under attack and hospitals have been overwhelmed. There is a public health disaster unfolding. Infectious diseases are spreading as sewers spill over. The Gazan people are facing the highest levels of food insecurity ever recorded. Famine is around the corner. For children, this is particularly traumatic with no food, no water and no school. Bombing day in, day out, Gaza has become uninhabitable. 
threats to a whole population's very existence all happening as the world watches. The death toll is horrific. 7,000 remain missing, already dead, or dying slow, excruciating deaths, trapped under rubble, and decomposing bodies are left in the open where they were killed, some picked upon by animals. Entire towns, villages, and refugee camps are being wiped from the map, and four out of five people in famine in the world today are living in Gaza. Deaths from starvation, outstripping deaths from bombings. 247 Palestinians are being killed and are at risk of being killed every day. Many literally being blown to pieces. 48 mothers are killed every day. 117 children are killed every day. UNICEF has called it a war on children. Each day over three medics, two teachers and more than one UN employee or journalist are killed each day. Risk of famine increases each day. 6,219 people will be wounded every day, moving from place to place, seeking sanctuary. Each day, 10 children will have one or both legs amputated, not necessarily with anaesthetic. And more homes will be destroyed. More cemeteries destroyed, more bodies desecrated. Ambulances, hospitals and medics will keep being attacked and killed. Those trying to rescue people buried will be killed, at least one every second day. Each day people will be forced to relocate from shelter, often where they have been told to move to, and more kids will become WCNSF, wounded child, no surviving family. There is an urgent need for provisional measures to stop this. There could not be a more compelling case. There must be an end to the decimation of Gaza and its people. Condition of urgency is met for the act of causing an act of prejudice that can occur at any time these can and are happening. Since South Africa's proceedings were initiated on the 29th of December, 1,703 Gazans have been killed and 3,252 have been injured. This is a besieged population trapped with nowhere to go. And the standout quote from Blini Negrale's testimony was easily, look in the mirror and ask where was I when Gaza was going through a genocide. South Africa is here before this court in the peace palace. Now there are other testimonies by the other lawyers on South Africa's team, which were fantastic too, on procedures, on rights to protection, on the measures that are required. But this video is already longer than usual for me. This is what they want the court to lay down and expeditely as soon as possible. It's a nine point plan and it really is the basics. And I really can't see any argument from this, especially based on the, uh, the brilliant way that these South African lawyers have laid out the case here. Measures requested as a matter of urgency. One, the State of Israel must immediately suspend its military operations in Gaza. Two, any organisations subject to their control, direction or influence cease and desist. Three, South Africa and Israel shall each take all measures to prevent genocide. Four, Israel shall under the Genocide Convention desist from the commission of all acts including killing, causing bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting conditions of life intended to bring about their destruction or imposing measures designed to prevent births in the group. Five, Israel shall in relation to Palestinians take all measures, including the rescinding of orders to prevent expulsion and forced displacement from homes, the deprivation of adequate food and water, access to humanitarian assistance, fuel, shelter, hygiene, sanitation, clothes and destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza. Six, Israel shall ensure its military and any irregular army armed units or associated individuals or organizations do not commit any acts described above or direct public incitement to commit genocide or be complicit of inciting genocide. Seven, Israel shall take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence associated with their actions. Therefore, not restrict fact finding missions or investigations to gather evidence. Eight, Israel shall submit a report on all measures giving effect to this order within one week and thereafter at such regular intervals as the court orders until a final ruling is made. And nine, Israel shall refrain from any action and ensure no action is taken to aggravate or make this situation more difficult to resolve. By referencing many other cases in their testimony which I've not brought up, South Africa has also laid out that if the court does not grant a provisional order, it will undermine international justice and means Israel will again be seen as having exceptions being made for it. This is the first genocide the world has ever seen where victims are able to broadcast their own destruction, thanks to the ability to stream events to tablets and mobile phones the world over. 
Palestine represents a moral failure, therefore, for the world to act when it was required to, as it was decades ago, frankly. And so it has come to this court here and now. The world should be horrified. It should be outraged that there is no safe space in Gaza. And the world should also be ashamed that it's taken this long and come this far. I will, of course, cover Israel's response to all of this tomorrow. Meanwhile, here's a video covering the possible outcome of South Africa winning their provisional order as laid out by a genocide legal expert. Definitely worth a watch if you're wondering what the point is to all of this at the end of the day. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next video. Cheers, folks. Right, so today Israel have laid out their defence for their genocide in Gaza. And yes, I'm very much still going to call it that because their defence wasn't really aimed at the court, unless these court judges are truly stupid, and I find that hard to believe, but instead aimed at the media. Because the court they're pleading to isn't the International Court of Justice so much as the Court of Public Opinion. Reinforcing that is the fact that mainstream outlets like Sky and the BBC were happily showing Israel's defence on TV in full where well, they completely ignored South Africa's case being presented just yesterday. Truly impartial service. Show the majority white nation, ignore the majority black one. But it may well work out that they wish they hadn't done so, given just how terrible the Israeli defence has been. There's almost an arrogance to it. Almost like believing if they show up and tell the court all the same nonsense they've been making public for the last three months, that they'll swallow it too. If this case, if the provisional measures South Africa have requested are not granted, then the ICJ are not a serious institution. And if Israel can turn up and basically claim Hamas made us do some genocide, but really they did war crimes first, is the basis for their defence. Right, so we thought the Israel defence at The Hague was going to be bad, but quite how bad I did not expect. They're literally pulling all the same stories, all the debunked claims that we've seen for weeks and weeks and presented them as fact in front of a court, the world court making me believe they are still wooing public opinion rather than pursuing any genuine legal win. Perhaps because they haven't got a hope of winning and need to get their excuses in order? Well, Israel's got a track record of being treated differently to everyone else, so let's not assume anything on that score just yet. But the tone was set when the Israeli delegation all turned up wearing yellow ribbons, a not-so-subtle nod to their intention on playing the victim card, the ribbons symbolic of the yellow stars Jews were made to wear by the Nazis. I'll start with the Israeli agent who began proceedings, because he really set the tone. up the Holocaust from the get-go as proof of their dedication for avoiding genocide, since it was attempted against them. In other words, very much in their traditional habit of saying, you can't challenge us, we're Israel, remember the Holocaust? But it gave an idea of where things were going to go from there. The claim was made that this war was not started by Israel, that they did not want war, and claimed self-defence against Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and others. They made the claim that civilian suffering was tragic. They called it heartbreaking. The claim was made that Hamas have sought to maximise civilian casualties and that Israel sought to minimise them. The agent made the case that genocide cannot be applied to them because the convention was not designed to address impacts on hostilities on civilians, even when the use of force raises serious issues, suffering and loss of life. It was set up to address malevolent crime of genocide. The agent has blamed this age of social media and identity politics, which has meant people now seek to maximise outrageous terms and vilify and demonise, and they're picking on them. This is irresistible to people, apparently, to people who would wish ill upon Israel. The agent took a swipe at South Africa, a regular thing, saying they have put forward a profoundly distorted factual and legal picture, since their case relies on a deliberately curated decontextualized and manipulative description of current hostilities. They took another swipe at South Africa by claiming they have come to the ICJ as a guardian of humanity, but delegitimizing Israel's existence, as they claim South Africa have, rings hollow, and it's in, in its description of hostilities erases Jewish history and Palestinian agency or responsibility. The agent claimed South Africa has added to the delegitimization of Israel that has gone on since 1948 and that their words sounded indifferent from Hamas rhetoric. They accused South Africa of removing both Hamas's responsibility and the humanity of Israeli victims are removed from their view in their assertions. The agent then moved on to the events of October 7th, of course. We had to get there eventually. They stood before the court. They claimed thousands of Hamas and other militants breached Israel's borders by land, sea and air 
invading over 20 communities and the site of a music festival. What proceeded next under the cover of fire by thousands of rockets being fired into Israel was the wholesale massacre, mutilation, rape and abduction of as many citizens as the terrorists could find before Israel forces repelled them. They tortured children in front of parents and parents in front of children, burned people, including infants, alive, and systematically raped and mutilated scores of women, men and children. All times, some 1,200 people were butchered that day, more than 5,500 maimed, 240 hostages abducted, including infants, entire families, persons with disabilities and Holocaust survivors, some of whom have since been executed, many of whom have been tortured, sexually abused and starved in captivity. We know of the brutality of October 7th, he said, not only from harrowing testimonies of survivors, but from the unmistakable proof of carnage and sadism left behind and the forensic evidence taken at the scene. The claim made before the ICJ was that we know all of this because the assailants proudly filmed and broadcast their barbarism. This was the largest mass murder of Jews in a single day since the Holocaust, the agents said. Claims of Palestinian brutality made by the Israeli agent, including a farmer being burned alive with his family in their house, and a woman who was raped at the Nova Festival, whilst another cut off her breast and played with it. She was then shot in the head afterwards. They used a recording of claimed phone calls from a Hamas operative using a Jewish victim's phone to call their parents to tell them what they'd done as well, much like other examples we've seen of them do this that have been previously debunked. On the provisional measures South Africa have requested, the agent claimed it would stop Israel fulfilling its obligations, defend its citizens and rescue the hostages. To the 110,000 alleged internally displaced Israelis unable to go home. They also criticised the fact there was no mention by South Africa of the ongoing suffering being caused by Hamas and treats the hostages they still hold as an afterthought before showing a montage of people they claim Hamas have killed. They accuse South Africa of thwarting Israel's attempts to defend itself, to let Hamas get away with its murder, but leave Israel defenceless as Hamas continues. They claim Hamas enjoys close relations with South Africa, despite them being designated a terrorist organisation by numerous other states. They have the nerve, quite frankly, to accuse South Africa of using unverified information provided by Hamas and stood there straight-faced while saying Israel is upholding the law in the face of Hamas, ignoring it. They say the Genocide Convention itself exists as a solemn promise to the Jewish people and all people of never again. If Israel gets ruled against or the provisional measures requested by South Africa are enforced, the agent claimed the Genocide Convention will become an aggressor's charter for terrorists who hide behind civilians at the expense of a state seeking to protect its people against them, and as such suggests the case against them be dismissed as a libel. We haven't even got to the lawyers yet, though frankly, you weren't missing out much on that front. This was expected to be a risible attempt at Israel exonerating themselves, but actually it was remarkable for being so tediously dull for the most part. South Africa's pre uh, presentation was far more engaging and dynamic and a hell of a lot more professional. Let's just do some debunking here before I move on though. The claim Israel didn't start the war. This didn't start on October 7th. Gaza has been under siege since Hamas were elected as a government in Gaza in 2007. It's been occupied territory since 1967. You could take it all the way back to the Nakba of 1948. This war goes way back. Hamas didn't start it. Hamas didn't exist before 1987. So they need to try again if they're going to blame Hamas for literally everything. The Genocide Convention is not designed to address hostility impacts on civilians, which is true in and of itself as a statement, but it was set up to address attempts to wipe people out in their entirety. This is happening. People have been forcibly displaced entirely en masse, north to south. Attempts to push these people out of Gaza have been made and have been discussed. Convoys of safety have been targeted and shot at and people killed trying to leave. And when in the south, where they've been told to go, where they were told they'd be safe, Israel's bombed them there as well. There's no evidence that Israel is trying to avoid civilian casualties. There is evidence they are trying to wipe everyone out, that they are maximizing them, not minimizing them. So the reverse of what the agent claimed, in my opinion, based on what I've seen is true. Blaming social media tickled me for the public opinion, turning against Israel. All of a sudden, the South Africa said yesterday, the people being attacked are able to film and share their own destruction. And they're doing so. People can see for themselves the world over and make up their own minds about what is going on out there. Not only that Israel has been encouraging their own people to publish videos on TikTok as well, their own soldiers sharing what they are doing 
And South Africa actually used some of that as part of their own evidence yesterday. The scale of the incursion has clearly been embellished. Hamas don't have air assault capabilities and didn't go in to Israel by sea either. They went by land. All the claims of burning people alive have been debunked after 200 bodies Israel claimed were theirs turned out to be Hamas and they didn't realise it. It took them six weeks to work that out. And I don't think they're the sort of people to burn their own people. But you do you know who we have verified reports of and footage of people killing their own people? Yes, the IDF operating under Hannibal directives to prevent hostage taking. Kill them before they can be taken hostage. They made much of the 1,200 people killed, but investigation is leaning more and more to many of those, if not the majority, being killed by the IDF itself. 5,500 wounded, but those figures pale in comparison to those killed in Gaza, 1% of the entire population of which is now dead. Who, again, are the fault of Hamas, of course, but I'll come on to such some more presently. Claims of torture have been disputed by Israeli eyewitnesses and survivors who said they were treated well, as of hostages released, contrary to the claims here that they were starved. And of course, after all the cheap shots at South Africa, which that delegation made none of yesterday, simply sticking with facts they can actually evidence, they made what amount to a, amounted to a veiled threat to the ICJ, that if they get ruled against, the genocide charter would become an aggressor's charter. Do all of the mirrors in Israel have a rose tint to them, I wonder? Anyway, let's move on to the lawyer representations. And actually, only one is really worth spending any time on. Though it has to be acknowledged that the first lawyer up for the Israeli delegation, a chap called Malcolm Shaw, losing his papers was literally the highlight of his testimony, as dull as that was, which I admit to nearly nodding off as he referenced the Bible and all manner of other global issues, giving a feeling of him defending a very large elephant in the room by avoiding talking about it. His dignity, quite honestly, going the same way as his papers and Netanyahu's sanity and symbolic of the entire Israeli defence, which was a shameless shambles. I might have actually found one of his papers, actually, this pretty much summed up his waffle. The most notable part of Shaw's testimony was his attempt to place context on Netanyahu's Amalek threat. Clearly something that has the Israeli legal team bothered because it's a reference to a literal biblical genocide. He only made things worse for them, if anything, by showing even more of what Netanyahu happened to say at that point. And if the words of Israel's Prime Minister are your go-to for a defence, then you're in more trouble than I originally thought. But the legal representation that really summed it all up, with its dishonesty, with what Israel frankly had the nerve to present to the ICJ, was that made by a lawyer called Galit Ragawan. She had the really annoying habit of huffing periodically throughout her testimony, seemingly for emotional effect. But it got even worse when she was later stopped and asked to slow down in her testimony because the interpreters couldn't actually keep up with it. Hers was a testimony of complaint overall, I thought. She complained about Hamas's tactics and that South Africa only mentioned them in passing when Hamas is the government in Gaza. Well, Hamas are also not a state, also not signatories to the Genocide Convention, so can't be put on trial under it for either of those reasons. But Israel can, and is, so complain about Hamas as much as you like. You need to be in the International Criminal Court for that, the ICC. It is also based in The Hague. I appreciate, given the performance of this legal team, that might have been an easy mistake for them to have made. You walked into the wrong room, maybe. Well, Ragawan complained that urban warfare will always result in death and damage, but excused it on her nation's part by saying they are exacerbated because that is Hamas's desire. I struggle to see how blowing up Gaza and levelling the place is Hamas's plan. They have to live there as well, you know. Hamas is embedded amongst the civilians, she said, and sure, they are, much like the IDF headquarters is based in downtown Tel Aviv, isn't it, Ms. Ragawan? It's also incredibly densely populated in Gaza, so there's an argument for that, sure, but is it relevant to a case of genocide when you can also argue, well, there's only so many places Hamas can literally go? I'm not so sure. Civilian deaths are the unintended but lawful outcome of urban warfare, she said. So how hard are you really trying to avoid them then with your £2,000 bombs being dropped on a refugee camp and the excuses given by one of your media skivvies like Elon Levy being basically, whoops, we dropped the wrong one. Well, what is the right bomb to drop on a refugee camp then? Do explain that. Well, according to Ms. Ragawan, because this is recognised under the terms of international humanitarian law, that that recognises this. Genocide is not therefore constituted. Many civilian deaths are being caused by Hamas themselves, she said. Booby-trapped homes, mines in alleyways, misfired rockets landing inside Gaza. According to her, the IDF proved Hamas hit a hospital because, well, the IDF never lied during this conflict, have they? 
She complained about damage to civilian structures claimed by South Africa as damage to infrastructure. But South Africa, Ms. Ragawan told us, do not appreciate how much said infrastructure Hamas uses for their military purposes. Hundreds of kilometres of tunnels causing buildings to collapse, she said. I always wonder when I hear about these tunnels that if there are so many of them, how come we've never seen any arrests made in them? Photos followed as part of her presentation, not of the tunnels though, but of showing missiles uh, under a child's bed and a Hamas operative pointing a rocket launcher through a wall, as well as an aerial photograph of what they claim to be a rocket launch site on the roof of a school. None of this excuses Israel's genocide, even if true, which there will be doubts over. How handy for a Hamas operative to pose for the picture. Is it a school in that blurry, grainy black and white photo? It could be any building from above. And as for the rocket launchers under the bed, well, how about the laptop with an IDF code number written in Hebrew on the charger that was found in Shifa Hospital, where the staff speak and use Arabic? Or indeed, what about the biggest IDF photographic gaffe of them all, in my opinion? The guns and grenades all stashed behind an MRI machine, a great big donut-shaped magnet that's strong enough to chew up hospital beds if they get too close to it. That can't possibly have been a setup, could it? Well, Ms. Ragawan, we've gone to hospitals next, funnily enough. South Africa claimed that Israel targeted the Gaza health system, claims this ignores Hamas's use of hospitals. And then came more photos. Photos taken at, oh, it's Shifa Hospital in the north of Gaza. It's Gaza's largest hospital, you may remember. And the same place where those weapons were found behind the MRI machine. And oh my God, they included the MRI machine photo. They literally presented it to the ICJ. That photo on its own, that physics defying proof as Israel regard it. It should bin off their entire testimony that they've used such a risible piece of photography as evidence. should undermine everything. She still wasn't finished, though. She claimed these photos constitute proof that Hamas is there. They don't. The IDF have faked too much imagery before to just take that word as read. Ms. Ragawan made the claim that the IDF arrested Hamas operatives there, but photos from the IDF hardly constitute proof. They might well be Hamas operatives, or as we've seen Israel do elsewhere, they fake it by making prisoners that they've got dress up as such. And the director who they arrested weeks previously, the hospital director, has apparently claimed staff there are part of Hamas. But under what condition did he make that admission, though? Because we haven't seen him in a long, long time. In every hospital, the idea of have apparently found evidence of Hamas use. Using hospitals as shields, patients and staff are at risk. She made the ridiculous claim that they haven't bombed any of them. Israel has bombed no hospitals. Claim they offered assistance to move patients and staff. Well, explain those dead babies and incubators then. Oh, there was a photograph of them apparently delivering a new incubator. That was used as evidence. All wrapped up in plastic, all very nice and shiny. Through a hole in the wall it was getting delivered, did you know? And without any power in the hospital, as we know Israel's cut it off, how exactly is that incubator going to run? Also, if you want to help the hospitals... Why wouldn't you allow genuine supplies through to them? Why have you targeted ambulances and aid trucks and the Red Crescent and the Red Cross and Medicine Sans Frontières killing aid workers in the process? We've all seen and heard testimonies from all of those aid agencies. Hamas steals aid at the expense of the population, she's also claimed. Hamas controlled distribution. Medical aid was stolen by them and they hoard fuel, we were told as well. Israel cannot be genocidal when they've expended resources to tell people when to go and where to go to avoid the fighting, facilitating aid and providing ambulances. And yet still, we know you've attacked evacuation convoys and bombed people at a later date in the places you told them to go. That excuse doesn't wash either. This was all in all a tedious testimony, full of the same nonsense people have been debunking now for months, thinking it's good enough for The Hague. That's arrogant. It really shouldn't be good enough. But we now have to wait however long for the 15 judges to take to arrive at their decision regarding the provisional measures South Africa have asked for, which will hopefully mean an order for a ceasefire. I really can't see any justification for that not being handed down, given just how incredulous, incompetent and delusional a presentation Israel just put on. And if you haven't seen South Africa's professional outing in The Hague yesterday, where they crushed it, fear not. I covered that too. Watch this video next, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so last night, without a parliamentary vote, our unelected Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, decided he can find some money for war. I mean, there's never any for public services, of course. There's always money for war, isn't there?
begin a bombing campaign against the Houthis in Yemen, jumping on Genocide Joe's coattails to bomb the Houthis. No mandate to run a lemonade stand in this country, let alone take us into war in the Middle East. But of course, the reasons for doing so are even worse. The Houthis have imposed a blockade in the Red Sea to Israeli shipping. They were driving away their ships using rockets and drones and speedboats. And up until the US turned up with a warship, nobody had died. Then the US destroyed three Houthi boats, killing 10 of them. Yemen is doing this in solidarity with Gaza, of course, when Israel is inflicting a genocide on the people there. This is in court right now, today. This happening, this, this event, this bombing in Yemen happened between the two hearings at The Hague. We are literally getting involved in conflict to allow a genocidal nation to carry on committing genocide. I'm actually revolted at what Sunak has done. But it gets more despairing even than that, because as usual, the Red Tory, Keir Starmer, has come out in support of this as well. Right, so Joe Biden has gone to war with Yemen and Rishi Sunak has basically gone, wait for me, as he quickly raised the kids dressing up box for a military uniform that might fit him. They've issued a pathetic statement, the government, on this saying, recognising the broad consensus as expressed by 44 countries around the world on December 19, 2023, as well as the statement by the UN Security Council on the 1st of December 2023, condemning Houthi attacks against merchant and commercial vessels transiting in the Red Sea, our governments issued a joint statement on the 3rd of January 2024, which called for the immediate end of illegal attacks and warned that malign actors would be held accountable should they continue to threaten lives, the global economy and the free flow of commerce in the region's critical waterways. Despite this strong warning, attacks in the Red Sea have continued, including the launch of numerous missiles and one-way attack aerial vehicles against ships in the Red Sea on January the 9th, 2024, including US and UK vessels. On January the 10th, 2024, the UN Security Council passed UN Security Council Resolution 2722, which also condemned these attacks and demanded that they cease. In response to continued illegal, dangerous and destabilising Houthi attacks against vessels, including commercial shipping transiting in the Red Sea, the armed forces of the United States and United Kingdom, with support from the Netherlands, Canada, Bahrain and Australia, conducted joint strikes in accordance with the inherent right of the individual and collective self-defence, consistent with the UN Charter against a number of targets in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. These precision strikes were intended to disrupt and degrade the capabilities the Houthis used to threaten global trade and the lives of international mariners in one of the world's most critical waterways. The Houthis' more than two dozen attacks on commercial vessels since mid-November constitute an international challenge. Today's actions demonstrated a shared commitment to freedom of navigation, international commerce and defending the lives of mariners from illegal and unjustifiable attacks. Our aim remains to de-escalate tensions and restore stability in the Red Sea, but let our message be clear. We will not hesitate to defend lives and ensure the free flow of commerce in one of the world's most critical waterways in the face of continued threats. So, in summation, the UK is hiding behind the UN Charter as an excuse to mount military strikes on Yemen, whilst having been ignoring the UN Charter for the last three months, as far as Israel is concerned, in order for them to commit genocide. You can argue that Yemen are upholding the UN Charter by sanctioning Israel more than the UN itself via the Security Council and Western leaders are. They are UN member state themselves. But that didn't stop. As the government statement I just read out alluded to, the Security Council bringing a motion to instruct Yemen to halt their attacks on commercial and merchant shipping in the Red Sea just Wednesday gone. Now who could have brought such a resolution to the Security Council? I wonder. Well, wonder no more because of course it was the US. When it comes to the Israel anyway, the veto-happy United States are going to be there to be st to stand up and be counted. The resolution passed and Yemen summarily ignored it. They are holding Israel to account when the West refuses to. So now the West, the UK, the US, Netherlands, Germany, as well as New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Bahrain, South Korea are bombing Yemen. Surgical strikes, specific targets as they claim. But if Israel wasn't on the receiving end of their actions, you can bet they wouldn't be bothering. This is about Israel, first and foremost. Protect them at all costs, despite the genocide they are perpetrating. It's day two of the genocide case brought by South Africa against Israel today in The Hague. And before Israel could even lay down their first bit of nonsense, this happened in Yemen. If Israel get ruled against, it could it could be state actors act, attacking Yemen now that are in the dock next, being a, it seemed to be aiding and abetting. The US are already being lined up by South African lawyers for a potential next stage litigation, apparently. It seems there's a queue of other nations eager to join them, not least of which the UK. 
Rishi Sunak has issued a statement himself on this action. He said, The Royal Air Force has carried out targeted strikes against military facilities used by Houthi rebels in Yemen. In recent months, the Houthi militia have carried out a series of dangerous and destabilizing attacks against commercial shipping in the Red Sea, threatening UK and other international ships, causing major disruption to a vital trade route and driving up commodity prices. Their reckless actions are risking lives at sea and exacerbating the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Despite the repeated warnings from the international community, the Houthis have continued to carry out attacks in the Red Sea, including against the UK and US warships just this week. This cannot stand! The United Kingdom will always stand up for freedom of navigation and the free flow of trade. We have therefore taken limited, necessary and proportionate action in self-defence, alongside the United States, along with non-operational support from the Netherlands, Canada and Bahrain, against targets tied to these attacks to degrade Houthi military capabilities and protect global shipping. The Royal Navy continues to patrol the Red Sea as part of the multinational Operation Prosperity Guardians to deter further Houthi aggression, and we urge them to cease their attacks and de-escalate. Never mind Yemen de-escalate, you de-escalate! Where did the money for all of this action come from, by the way? We're broke, you keep telling us. We can't afford anything anymore. More cuts to come. The only shipping affected is Israeli shipping. The only trade affected is Israeli trade. The only commodity prices rising are Israeli ones because the Houthis haven't touched anyone else. Not before you and Biden entered with a couple of warships, jumping up and down in a rage. Remove the word global or replace it with Israel. It all becomes a more honest statement. But he's not the only Tory weighing in either. Possibly even less welcome is a response from the also unelected Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, who said, The UK and the US have carried out targeted strikes on Houthi military targets in Yemen. The safety of UK vessels and the freedom of navigation across the Red Sea is paramount, and that is why we are taking action. As the United Security Council has made clear, the Houthis must hold attacks in the Red Sea. After Libya, a permanent period of silence from you on such matters as this would be very welcome, Dave. The Security Council can act to stop the Houthis, but it can't act to stop the Israeli genocide. But it really isn't the Security Council driving either of those decisions. It is the US choosing when to force through an action and when to veto it. Its hypocrisy is off the charts right now. The UN is dancing to the United States tune, and you're basically bloody cheerleaders for that. But the blue Tories sadly aren't alone in this, because the red Tories of Keir Starmer are as well. Starmer apparently determined to get that heir to Blair title down pat right down to the blood dripping off his hands. Starmer was on BBC Breakfast and was asked about this, saying, I did get a briefing last night from the Cabinet Office. Obviously I can't tell you what the content of that briefing was, but it is, I think, important that we had that briefing. When Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, I had a phone call with him on the first day, and amongst other things, we agreed that we would robustly challenge each other on the politics of the day. But when it came to national security, issues of defence of the country, we would seek to cooperate and work together. Well, when pushed by Charlie State as to whether he had given his support for this particular action in Yemen, though, Starmer said yes. Well, would you like to point out how this is a matter of self-defence? Yemen haven't attacked us. We put a warship off their coast in the Red Sea. We're the ones enabling a genocide in Gaza which Yemen are fighting against. Let's not pretend this is any more about self-defence in your eyes than it is in Sunak's. It is again all about Israel. Protect Israel. Stand by Israel. Well, not in my name you're not. Hello all you vote Labour to get the Tories out types. Does that include supporting genocide in Gaza or no? I just want to check. Well, here's an example. Nobody quite triggers the Starmoids like Jeremy Corbyn does, who, despite being at The Hague right now on as part of South Africa's delegation, still managed to tweet out a response to the strike on Yemen saying military action in Yemen by the UK and US government is a reckless act of escalation that will only cause more death and suffering. It is utterly disgraceful that Parliament has not even been consulted. When will we learn from our mistakes and realise that war is not the answer? Cue the always easily triggered fake lefty and Starmer's stand parliamentary seat chaser Paul Mason who came out to Jeremy with a reply saying Rubbish, Jeremy. The strikes were a last resort after terrorists repeatedly attacked working class seafarers. Do the right thing and support those risking their lives to keep civilian ships safe from terrorists. Well, by all means, get on the front line, Paul. We have no business out there, and this desperation to protect Israel from any measure of censure, despite the atrocities they are committing, is shameless and embarrassing, and you aren't doing it in my name. 
For all the talk of this unblocking commercial shipping, all this is doing is making the Red Sea completely impassable to everyone. No ships will now get through. The Houthis will be blamed for any economic hit we now get from it, despite very much instigating this ourselves for the sake of Israel, on Joe Biden's coattails, as I said before, chasing the US again, begging the question, which country are these politicians of ours really serving most, ours or theirs? Any civilian deaths that ensue following this act of idiocy by both main parties here or there, and both Sunak and Starmer will want dragging to The Hague and the ICC. We're prioritising fighting people, interrupting shipping, rather than dealing with a nation committing genocide. In fact, we're attacking one to protect the other. There are enough bombs being dropped on innocent civilians in Gaza. If you think that won't now happen in Yemen, then you're deluding yourselves, even when the Houthis have so far killed nobody, and Israel has killed tens of thousands. Spreading the tensions further, is that those Houthis? Well, they're around back, did you know? I don't know if the media mentions that nearly enough. Well, this means Iran will inevitably get involved as well now, a much more powerful country. So little wonder people are talking of World War Three happening here. And that all because nobody will tell Israel to stop blowing up innocent people. But they're happy to maybe blow up everyone else and cause catastrophe on a wider scale. The other angle to Sunak doing this, and you can just smell the thinking here as well, that he thinks there might be a Falklands moment in this to help his poll ratings. And Starmer clearly thinks likewise because he's copied him as always. The pair of them are pathetic. But if you're wondering what to watch next following this, then there's always a small matter of where the RAF are flying from to Yemen right now, as this video here will explain, because extra military personnel were sent to the Eastern Mediterranean, half of them to Cyprus, just the other day. The other half of them, well, we don't know exactly where they got sent. Well, I did wonder what they might be there for, and, well, isn't it convenient they happen to be just in the right place at just in the right time? Coincidence, perhaps? Surely not. I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so in light of how ardently the Labour Party are currently supporting Israel right now, it's worth asking, certainly with Jeremy Corbyn having gone to the International Court of Justice in The Hague this week as part of South Africa's delegation in their case against Israel, whether this gives some insight into how he was taken down as Labour leader versus how he was treated over that versus how Labour regard Israel here and now when they're committing genocide. We know the issue of anti-Semitism was weaponized against Corbyn, but with public opinion worldwide at an all-time low, as we witness the atrocities Israel are committing, and the fact Labour, regardless of that, are not only on side with Israel still, but now are prepared to go to war for them, supporting our, the Tories in doing so, should we not now be admitting, hang on here, Corbyn being critical of Israel and being pro-Palestine, he had a point, didn't he? And given what his own party did to him, how they chose to use anti-Semitism to do that, assisted by other pro-Israel organisations the media were more than happy to platform, is it not also true that we have not only a Labour Party so utterly entwined with Israel and pro-Israel interests, but that, as Corbyn has proven, there's little to no chance of undoing that? Right, so Jeremy Corbyn, former Labour leader, we know the chap, the guy who got me into politics, really, enthused and inspired me to get more involved. The opportunity of having the country run a different way to how it's always been, very, very appealing. Smeared for due hate as he was, though, never actually stood a chance, you might say. And looking back at what happened before with the knowledge of what is happening here and now in Israel and Gaza, I think it makes for a worthwhile opportunity for some reflection on what happened before with Corbyn and actually what all of it says about the Labour Party itself here and now and going forwards. Corbyn, we know, was undone at the 2017 general election by the party machine misappropriating funds to shore up favoured right-wing Labour MPs who didn't need the funding in lieu of other candidates who might have stood a chance getting it, such as the then Deputy Labour leader Tom Watson, who was also ardently pro-Israel. He actually sang for them in a show of his absolute dedication to Israel just the year before, in 2016, at a lunch event put on by the Labour Friends of Israel. He burst into a rendition of Am Yisrael in light of today's ongoing events. That would have gone down like cold sick if he'd done that now, wouldn't he? The thing is, though, it was going on then, just as it was going on now, really. The persecution of Palestinians has been going on for decades, has it not? From Gaza electing Hamas to run their authority in 2007, which resulted in sanctions against a territory which, like the West Bank, was occupied territory. 
It had been since 1967 and the Six Day War. We shouldn't forget that. Now Corbyn has long spoken out against the occupation for a two-state solution, which is supposed to be the UK's official stance on the Israel-Palestine situation. But being critical of Israel has. In fact, Corbyn said as much himself back in 2022. In an interview with a Lebanese broadcaster, Corbyn went ahead and said, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that my clearly stated support for the rights of the Palestinian people to be able to live in peace, free from occupation, free from being under siege, as in Gaza, and for those living in the refugee camps, particularly those in Lebanon, but other countries as well, with the right to return, played a factor in all of this. Literally standing up for the UK official position on Israel and Gaza, and Corbett admits it was part of the story of what brought him down. He was defending Gaza against all the things so many of us are, all are now, but he was doing it years ago. In fact, he's been doing it for decades. The phrase Corbyn was right often trends on social media, but that's because so often he ends up being proven right. Just yesterday, he spoke to Al Jazeera outside The Hague, and he was asked if he thought anything will actually change if there is a decision in favour of South Africa. And he said, everything is incremental. Every time you step out in the street and wave a Palestinian flag and say, stop the killing of Palestinian people. Every time somebody, me or somebody else in Parliament, that's an incremental difference. And the arguments about the arms trade, the supply of weapons to Israel, and the fact that President Biden sought to bypass Congress because he was afraid of the reaction there in order to send more weapons to Israel indicates a weakness in his position. And so this weekend, we've got demonstrations all over the world. There's a voice of ordinary people who are just appalled at what is going on. And also, I want to say thank you to those people in Israel who signed in support of the South African application to the International Court of Justice and those in Israel who have been demonstrating against the occupation of the West Bank and of Gaza because they want also to be able to live in peace. His position hasn't changed one iota in all these years, despite what he has been put through himself. But that is exactly why he could never be permitted, even by his own party, to lead. So intertwined with the fortunes of Israel, regardless of what they do, even now, as Israel commits genocide. There's no Jew hate there. There's no anti-Semitism there. He raises the often overlooked point that huge numbers of Israelis themselves want the same thing. An end to the occupation of Palestine and peace. But what did Labour do to him? Accuse him of being the racist. I'm not getting into that in any detail here, as far as this video goes, the outcome is the relevant bit where we got to because of it. Because, of course, it all culminated in him being cleared by the Labour Party National Executive Kit Committee, the NEC, of any wrongdoing, which should have been the end of matters as far as the Labour Party was concerned, restored to being a Labour MP and all of that. But instead, Keir Starmer chose to abuse his own executive powers and kept Corbyn suspended as a Labour MP. And he did that immediately after the NEC cleared him. And that is where Corbyn has remained ever since. A Labour member, but not allowed to sit as a Labour MP. And he's also been barred from standing as an MP again for Labour, singled out for that amongst all Labour members, since it is a total abuse of the Labour Party rulebook for that to be instigated. I say again, because no wrongdoing by Corbyn has ever found to have been committed. No racism, no nothing. The Labour leaks report showed how he was undermined in 2017. By 2019, at that general election, the anti-Semitism accusations were entrenched and it also became all about Brexit, an issue Keir Starmer at that point also undermined Jeremy Corbyn over. Promising a second referendum with Remain on the ballot as he did, Corbyn should have sacked him on the spot. If I'm critical of Corbyn at all, it's over that. Why did Starmer do that then? Sabotaging Labour's electoral chances going into the 2019 general election. And why keep Corbyn outside the parliamentary Labour Party abusing his own rule book to do so? Own party rule book to do that. Starmer is no leader. He needs his hand held at all times. He needs somebody telling him what to do from Peter Mandelson to Tony Blair to focus groups to consultancies, which are costing Labour an arm and a leg. But does Israel play a role there? He's a Zionist without qualification. Of course it does. It's impossible to say no when it comes to Keir Starmer, given Starmer owes everything to them. The Jewish Leadership Council director Trevor Chin, a Blairite donor, pretty much funded Starmer's leadership bid single-handedly. Starmer wouldn't tell us who was funding his campaign at that time, and if people knew it was the Israel lobby backing him, they'd have run a mile and would not have voted him in especially when Starmer was selling them a vision of keeping all of Corbyn's policies, those 10 pledges. And he has, of course, scrapped all of them now, officially done just at the end of last year. 
and has been conducting an aggressive purge of the Labour Party membership ever since he became leader, most notably over anti-Semitism. Prioritises anti-Semitism over all other forms of racism as the Labour Party does these days, as it has a bespoke complaints page on the uh, complaints uh, option on the Labour Party website for anti-Semitism when no other form of racism does. And actually, perversely, Starmer has purged more Jewish members from the Labour Party than any other Labour leader ever, showing actually it has nothing to do with anti-Semitism, but everything to do with being critical of Israel. And here we are in the here and now. Corbyn, in the quote I used a moment ago, criticised Joe Biden for bypassing Congress. Twice so far he's done this, to send more arms to Israel. And now Rishi Sunak, with Keir Starmer's support, has bypassed Parliament as well to bomb Yemen, who have been blockading Israeli shipping in support of Gaza, where the people are being ethnically cleansed. A genocide is being committed, something the UK will not overtly oppose, having abstained repeatedly in the UN Security Council votes for a ceasefire. Neither Sunak or Starmer will call for a permanent ceasefire, just what they call a sustained one, which is politics speak for doing jack. It's a nonsense. Yet they can go to war with another nation like Yemen, who are daring to hold Israel to account. War over shipping, they'll go to war over themselves. But a genocide can continue as long as it's Israel doing it. And you try and tell me that Israel doesn't have an overwhelming influence on our politics in the UK today. But that same politics didn't play a part in bringing down a guy who would have brought massive positive changes to how this country is run and held Israel to account being pro-Palestine himself and had been for decades. Helping this country run in a whole different way where public services are crumbling, wages decline, poverty soars, housing just becomes a bigger crisis every year. And yet our leaders can find no money to fix any of those problems. Yet the moment Israel's got a problem and is being blockaded by Yemen, they can find money to bomb one of the poorest Arab nations on the earth in defense of Israel. Putting Israel before us and our economic well-being in effect. How, is it, how, how can you read that any other way? I could have also talked about so much more here. The Labour Friends of Israel themselves, for instance, the LFI, just to nail that point and the fact Corbyn is kept out of Labour, but an actual Tory who crossed the floor and was welcomed with open arms in the Labour Party under Starmer, Christian Wakeford, who now seems to spend more time on paid-for junkets to Israel with LFI than he actually does spending time with his constituents in Berry. Then there's the NEC with a literal paid-for Israel lobbyist in Luke Akehurst in a position to make party-wide decisions. There's the role of the media in all of this, particularly Guardian journalist Jonathan Friedland's contributions. He who has the brass neck to criticise Israel in his columns now. And on top of that, the blatant example as shown by the BBC and Sky News, amongst other Western news outlets, where they showed Israel's defence at the Hague in full yesterday, yet did not do so the previous day with South Africa, preferring to continue making as big a story as possible about a post office scandal that's been known about for the last 10 years at least. We have two main parties right now so involved at so many levels with Israeli interests and lobbying and donors that for someone like Corbyn to come through and run the country, well, it, it just becomes more and more clear that it was utterly impossible. It was never going to be allowed. And the action taken to ensure he never led this country is now a matter of history. We often talk of establishment interests in alternative media, but how big a chunk of the establishment in this country is actually pro-Israeli as well? And this video here next will give you yet another example. A former Labour MP, former chair of LO5 in fact, now another paid for advocate for yet another pro-Israeli group. And guess who she chose to attack in order to encourage you to donate to them? A certain Jeremy Bernard Corbyn, of course. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks. Right, so as the world once more mounts protests against the Israeli genocide and in solidarity with the people of Gaza and the people of Yemen this time around as well this weekend, in light of the attacks by the US and the UK on them for daring to hold Israel to account and demand they end their genocide of Gaza, there is one particular protest happening this weekend which might carry more weight than most because it is in a position to shine a light on the UK involvement right now, which the mainstream media are predictably ignoring. And that is the protest planned for tomorrow taking place on the island of Cyprus, outside of the RAF base on Akrotiri, which has been used as a staging ground for both the UK and the US's flights into and out of Israel, presumably delivering supplies of arms, amongst other things. We can only guess that. We can only presume. 
because the UK government are remaining very, very tight-lipped about that. However, Akrotiri has also been revealed to be the launch site of the RAF strikes on Yemen in the last few days, showing the strategic importance of this airbase to both the UK and the US as a staging ground for their involvement in the Middle East. More attention needs to be paid to this. More questions need asking of the government of the action being taken by the military coming out of Cyprus. The months of silence over this airbase are damning, and the people of Cyprus themselves have now said, enough is enough. Right, so RAF Akrotiri on Cyprus, a UK airbase that's featured in a couple of my videos in recent months, being used as a staging ground for the UK, obviously, but also for US forces who have been permitted to use it, many flights of whom have been tracked flying into and out of Israel, Tel Aviv, presumably carrying much of the weaponry being supplied to Israel by the US that has bypassed Congress on two occasions and then some, and the UK as well, which in turn is being used against the people of Gaza as genocide and ethnic cleansing continues, and continues to be enabled by states aiding and abetting them. Massive questions are left unanswered, the old national security line being wheeled out to cover this, but frankly knowing what is going on in Israel and Gaza right now, seeing it with our own eyes, and knowing these flights have been going in and out of Israel, because flight plans and flight logs are a matter of public record, they have to be so as not to disturb commercial flights, it's not difficult for people to draw their own conclusions. The caginess of the government to admit what they are up to only adds to people's suspicions. But nothing quite screams you're guilty of enabling genocide quite like local Cypriots now organising not just a protest for Gaza and indeed Yemen too, as they now come under assault from daring to challenge Israel economically, stymieing their shipping, offending those state actors literally arming the occupiers and oppressors to the point they're now going to go to war with Yemen over it. But organising a protest at RAF Akrotiri itself this time. The UK have been a lot less cagey about their strikes on Yemen than they are about possible flights in and out of Israel. They've been boasting about it, really, able to justify that in the name of protecting global shipping, despite the Houthis in Yemen only blockading Israeli shipping and having killed nobody in the process. No deaths at all recorded until the UK and the US have got involved, and now Houthis have died, not just in blockaded shipping, but on land, thanks to the bombing carried out by the US and the UK that launched from Akrotiri. According to Cypriot news outlet Phil News, in an operation led by the United States, the Royal Air Force of the United Kingdom deployed two pairs of Typhoon FGR-4 aircraft from the Akrotiri base in Cyprus to conduct strikes against Houthi rebel targets in Yemen. The strikes carried out with the support of Voyager-type aerial refueling aircraft used guided Paveway 4 missiles. The British Ministry of Defence revealed that the targeted areas included buildings in the Banai region of northwest Yemen, a hotspot for Houthi drone launches for reconnaissance and attacks. Additionally, a military airport in the city of Al Hudaya, a launching point for cruise missiles and drones towards the Red Sea, was struck. Describing the attacks as carefully coordinated, effort to limit Houthi violations of international law in the Red Sea, the British Ministry highlighted the operation's focus on minimising risks to civilians, leading to the decision to carry it out during the night. Minimising risks to civilians, eh? Is that in the same way Israel do it or no? Of course, all this talk of upholding international law is a sham when Israel have violated it by occupying Palestine since 1967. But we always ignore that one, don't we? There's also an element of the Tories thinking this kind of military action might help their polling, perhaps a possible Falklands moment, which of course saved Margaret Thatcher's premiership and the damage to this country her political survival brought. But with the vast majority of people in this day and age not only better informed, thanks to social media giving people so much more access to so many more news outlets, no longer reliant on biased British mainstream sources to inform them. Therefore, I think their hopes on that score are for the birds. They will be condemned for what they have done instead, not least of which because it was an unelected Prime Minister without a mandate of his own, giving the orders for this, with the support of an unelected Foreign Secretary, all without the assent of Parliament, but hey, the Leader of the Opposition supported him in this as well, so, well, Sunak will probably be fine in which case. Nonetheless, the people of Cyprus, who see the flights leaving, who know what their island is being used for, have had enough. They're disgusted by it, and a protest organised for tomorrow, 14th of January, Sunday, 11am local time, has been organised by the Cyprus Peace Council. They've issued a statement on the matter saying, We call on everyone to join the demonstration to condemn the airstrikes being carried out from the British bases to transport war material to support the Israeli army's operations in the Gaza Strip. We convey the message that we are struggling to make Cyprus a bridge of peace and cooperation between the peoples. The Cypriot people do not want British military bases in their country. 
They represent a constant danger to our country and to the peoples of the region. That is precisely why we demand their closure. We demand that the government of the Republic of Cyprus at long last demands explanations to be given regarding the military activities of the British bases and that it express in practice its solidarity with the Palestinian people. They want the bases gone and you can understand their sentiments. Cyprus is not a large island. And the UK military have control of some 3% of the island. A big fat target is getting painted on Cyprus if things continue to escalate, therefore. There's more and more nations, more powerful, more well-armed nations in the Middle East may yet get involved. The staging ground for almost all US and UK activity, as Akrotiri appears to be right now, as Cyprus appears to be right now. They are also right to demand explanations of their leaders. As right now, the president of Cyprus, Nikos Christodoulides, is denying his island is being used as a base to supply Israel with military equipment, despite it seeming all but certain. But we certainly know as fact at this point, because our leaders have admitted it, that it has been used as a staging point to launch attacks on Yemen. Protests have been held in Cyprus already, but this is the first time the people have taken it directly to the doorstep of the UK military on their island. The rumour is the turnout is going to be absolutely huge tomorrow. I shall watch and wait with interest. And if you watch this video next, which I highly recommend you do, where the RAF's involvement in Israel gets detailed so far as we're able to, as far as Akrotiri is concerned, I'll hopefully catch you on the next vid. Cheers, folks.